Well, good morning, everyone. If you can hear me, I'd like to go ahead and call to order the COVID-19 Mitigation and Management Task Force for November 19th, 2020. It is 10 a.m. And uh, Megan Worth Ranson, if you could please call the roll. Megan, can you hear me? I can hear you now, loud and okay. clear. Gotcha, thanks. Caleb Cage? Here. Richard Whitley? Terry Reynolds? Here. Jamie Black? Dave Fogerson? Present. Felicia Gonzalez? Present. Brett Compton. Here. Megan North Ranson. Here. Chris Lake. Here. Dagny Stapleton. Wesley Harper. Here. Mark Pandori. Here. Kyra Morgan. I'm here. Lisa Sherrick. Here. Julia Peak. Here. Uh, Melissa Peak Bullock. Here. Melinda Southerd. Here. Leslie Mullenkamp. Here. And for the record, Samantha Laddick. I'm here. Sorry. You do have a quorum. Mr. Chair, you're on mute, sir. Thank you, Wesley. Um, I uh, will continue on with agenda item number two. I appreciate that very much. And uh, open public comment at this time. Um, we, uh, before we go into um, actually reviewing public comment, I wanna point out to everyone uh, who is a member that um, the, the public comment that were provided uh, in writing uh, ahead of today's meeting were provided to you in your uh, emails that were sent out by Megan Worth Ranston uh, recently, uh, as recently as yesterday. And uh, they are also available on the website for members of the public as well to view those. Um, we will not be reading those into the record, but I just wanna make sure that um, you uh, know that those, those are available to you. Those are public comments that need to be um, need to be considered as we carry out our deliberations here today and uh, throughout the, um, the, the, the rest of the, the time that we're carrying forward the duties of the, the task force here. Um, so uh, before we go into opening public comment, let me just ask um, our uh, Deputy Attorney General, Lax, uh, excuse me, uh, Samantha Laddick, if you could um, please uh, tell me if there's anything else I need to do regarding um, the written public comment before we move on? No, I just want to make sure that there's ample opportunity for the membership to review it um, before we move into the action items, but I, I think you've given them enough notice. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yes, please, please make sure to uh, review that as well. At this time, we'll open up to the um, members of the public. Um, agenda item number two, which is public comment, a reminder that no action may be taken on a matter raised under this item of the agenda until the matter is itself uh, placed on an agenda and included as an item upon which action can be taken. Public comments may be limited to two minutes per person at the discretion of the chair, and comments will not be restricted based on viewpoint. Um, as you know, because we are uh, using a uh, Zoom meeting format or a technology format here, uh, there's no in-person location for this meeting. So if you are, uh, if you have called in uh, with respect to the, or have called in through the process outlined in the agenda, please do make sure to press star six before speaking uh, and star six to mute yourself again when you're done speaking. Um, please identify yourself and make your public comment. If there's any, if there are any members of the public who would like to make public comment now,
Okay, I just wanna make sure that we are providing ample opportunity for members of the public to provide public comment. If you have called in and you're trying to speak and you cannot uh, get through, please press um, star six to unmute yourself and um, uh, star six to mute yourself again, but please identify yourself and make your public comment. Okay, thank you very much. We will close uh, agenda item number two. I wanna remind everybody again that you have public comment provided to you in your packet. It's also available on the Nevada Health Response website. Um, please review that and let's make sure that we're considering uh, those comments as we uh, deliberate today. So we'll move from there and go to the approval of the minutes for today. And uh, we'll um, entertain a motion to approve or amend or approve as amended um, the, uh, the minutes that have been provided today. Director Cage, Dave Fogerson, I move uh, approval. Terry Reynolds, I'll uh, second the motion. Motion to move and approve, or motion to approve uh, as presented by uh, Chief Fogerson and uh, seconded by Director Reynolds. Is there any discussion on this agenda or this motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed vote no? Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna continue on with the um, agenda item. As, as you all know, recently, we've had uh, a number of uh, external agencies uh, partner agencies throughout the state who have provided us updates um, on what uh, the, the goings on of their institutions, Washoe County School District, University of Nevada, Reno. Um, last time we've had others from specific programs within the state as well. Um, I've invited Chancellor Melody Rose, uh, Dr. Rose from the Nevada System of Higher Education to provide us a presentation on um, an update on uh, an overview on mitigation efforts for um, students, faculty, and staff at NSHE, the Nevada System of Higher Education, and what's going on there. Um, as many of you know, I, I, my previous job was with the Nevada System of Higher Education. I never had the pleasure of working with Dr. Rose. However, um, I uh, have had a number of opportunities to talk to her, and I really welcome her input and participation today. And, uh, the oper and, and I'm grateful, because I know how busy her schedule is as well, that she's taken the uh, time out of that busy schedule in order to provide us some comments. Dr. Rose, there you are. Um, please proceed. Good morning all. Director Cage, thank you very much and members of the task force. Thank you all so much for the invitation to be with you this morning. Uh, it's a privilege to see you, uh, see your faces on the screen, and it will be an even bigger privilege at some point to have the opportunity to meet you and get to know you. Uh, thank you for your service to the state and for all you're doing to keep Nevadans safe. Um, again, for the record, Melody Rose, Chancellor of the Nevada System of Higher Education. And I'd like to begin my comments this morning by thanking Governor Sisolak and his tremendous staff, uh, as well as all of our government and community partners for their continued communication and support of NSHE throughout this pandemic. Uh, we are very much in this with you and we appreciate the partnership. As we know, the health and well-being of Nevada's public higher education community, which includes students, staff, faculty, administrators, and surrounding communities, continues to be our utmost priority in the midst of this dynamic uh, and uh, protracted pandemic. Communication and coordination of resources, transparency, and reliance on the best health and science information available is really central to our COVID response efforts. Since I joined the system on September 1st, I have literally met with hundreds of students, staff, and faculty, and I've had the opportunity to visit all of our degree granting institutions in a safe and socially distanced manner. And I've actually been very impressed with compliance on our campuses with everything from masking to social distancing and limiting gatherings. 
Over the summer, uh, before I arrived, I was given the opportunity to review the campus COVID-19 plans that each of them had constructed. And I can assure you that these plans were thoughtfully devised and based upon data and healthcare expertise to guide each campus's decision-making process. As we know, our campuses are um, uh, have all kinds of situations. They're very different from one another. And so I would say that there is no one size fits all answer to our mitigation efforts, but each institution is equipped uh, to address the challenges based on their particular local needs. Our institutions are therefore emphasizing flexibility and the willingness to pivot at a moment's notice to ensure that we are aligned with health and science-based best practices. We understand and share the concerns of our student staff and faculty regarding this pandemic. Uh, and I'll speak later to the challenges around anxiety and stress and mental health more broadly. And that is why and she started a COVID-19 task force of its own that allows all of our institutions to share information and resources and especially best practices as we continue to serve our more than 100,000 students. This task force was created long before my arrival back in March of 2020. It is chaired by my colleague and she Chief General Counsel Joe Reynolds and it is comprised of representatives nominated by the presidents of each ENSHI institution uh, with expertise in student medicine and healthcare, public safety, legal advice, campus facilities and operations, diversity and equity, and communications. And if there's interest uh, at a later time, I can provide the membership of our task force to you. The task force meets frequently um, and uh, aggressively to identify resources, to communicate information and to discuss response strategies as the pandemic continues to evolve. The task force is in addition to active COVID-19 work groups that are formed on each one of the institutions. As we approach the end of fall 2020 semester, ENSHE and its institutions are continuing a hybrid approach of remote and in-person instruction. For example, a science class might be designed to include online lectures to avoid those large gatherings, but also provide small in-person laboratory sessions that follow established social distancing protocols. Additional safety measures include reducing the size of those labs, using masks, and increasing testing availability. On the whole, I would submit that we are roughly 75% online currently. Certain employees throughout ENSHI are continuing to work remotely wherever possible, and where doing so won't compromise essential student and faculty support services. In October, as COVID-19 trends worsened, I modified ENSHI's own policy for system admin and systems computing services, allowing employees even greater flexibility to choose to work from home. And then in response to Governor Sisolak's November 10th press conference and his stay at home request, I immediately directed that ENSHI system admin and system computing services offices in Las Vegas and in Reno to physically close and I asked all employees to work remotely for the two week freeze period. We will reevaluate this situation after we have additional guidance from the governor later this month. I have also worked with each institutional president and directed recently that all ENSHI institutions transition to as much remote instruction as possible from the Thanksgiving weekend through the end of fall semester in mid-December to again, limit contact opportunities. This additional direction is intended to limit contact points for students in particular who may travel home, visit family or friends during the holiday break and then return to campus. We are prepared to pivot again, depending on what we see in terms of potential emergent clusters. Our institutions are currently in the midst of finalizing their plans for the spring 2021 
instruction. And some institutions, as you may have seen, such as UNR, have eliminated the spring break entirely. Others are considering doing so. And despite some relaxation of in-person gathering limits per gubernatorial directives and county restrictions, we are choosing to maintain a 50-person classroom limitation. Our spring plans will continue with a very strong emphasis in hybrid instruction and follow and will follow all gubernatorial OSHA, CDC, and county health guidance. I want to speak specifically to COVID-19 positive cases at the institutions. NCHI is reporting weekly COVID-19 positive cases throughout its eight institutions and system administration. As one of my first actions as chancellor in September, I directed that each NCHI institution would weekly compile and provide data on the number of positive cases from students, staff, and faculty, and to post that information on the NCHI website. Centrally collecting data was new for us. I am provided an updated report at the beginning of every week, and I monitor that data with the presidents to spot clusters or trends. Let me just give you a couple of numbers uh, to give you a context of our, our positive cases. From March 2020 all the way through November 13th, cumulative totals are as follows. UNLV reported during that period 321 student cases, 68 faculty cases. NSC, 39 students, six faculty. DRI, one faculty. CSN, 151 students, 30 faculty. And that provides you with a total in the Southern Nevada institutions of 511 students, 105 faculty uh, over that um, nearly eight month spread. In the North, UNR reported during that same time period, 871 students, 83 faculty. DRI North had two faculty positive tests. TMCC, 73 students, 15 faculty. GBC, 12 students, six faculty. WNC, 34 students, seven faculty. And all of system admin, one faculty for a total among the Northern institutions of 990 students, 114 faculty across an eight month period. And she's trends in the South have been inconsistent week by week. Some weeks numbers go up and the following week they go down. And she's trends in the North have, more, have been more consistently on the rise, especially in the past three weeks. And as many of you may have noticed, UNR took additional aggressive steps in October to protect its students, staff, and faculty. But one thing is clear, where there have been positive cases within our institutional communities, there is virtually no evidence of campus-based spread. We are executing containment planning very effectively. The data, as I said, is being released every Monday, and I have directed our institutions and system admin to make this data public as part of our full commitment to transparency and accountability. And I'll just say on a personal note, as the parent of two current college students myself, I know that having this information is paramount in making the best decisions for my family, and I'm proud that NSHE is a model in the country in this regard. But we know that some concerns continue. And so let me speak directly to one of my top concerns, which is mental health. It is often overlooked as we understand and understand more broadly in our society and consistently under-resourced and it impacts all of our lives. During the COVID-19 pandemic, an unprecedented amount of uncertainty about the present and future combined with frequent isolation disjointed me methods of communication and instruction, heavier than usual workloads, and basic fear about safety and well-being, in addition to economic uh, instability, have contributed to increased levels of stress, anxiety, and grief by all of our communities. Uh, but on that basis, I have ordered the development of a COVID-19 mental health task force at NSHE to identify the mental health needs facing our community during the COVID-19 pandemic and the resources that currently exist within NSHE to address those needs. 
as well as those available beyond at local county, state, federal, and nonprofit entities. We will also ask the task force to develop an actionable set of recommendations on how to communicate these resources to NC students, staff, and faculty, and how to get assistance. And they may, in addition, make added recommendations about how to improve our services, awareness, and resources for mental health. I am currently pulling together a talented mental health professional list uh, based on experts from across our system. And I anticipate those members to include several licensed psychologists, medical doctors, doctors of education, a dean of student health, counseling services, human resources, student advisors, and of course, legal and government affairs professionals. I intend to formally announce the composition of this task force in the coming weeks, and I will kick off the task force's work by conducting a virtual listening tour myself with students and faculty. A few more items before I wrap up. Uh, I want you to know how much NC is with you in helping us resolve this pandemic. Our eight institutions, I have to say proudly, have stepped up to help their local communities and state during this unprecedented time. Whether it's our students who are delivering food safely to the elderly, our institutions loaning or donating urgently needed medical supplies, including ventilators and PPE, to first responders and hospitals, or professors sharing their knowledge with the media and the world, you can count on NSHE's eight institutions to continue to help Nevada get through this historic event. In terms of athletics, which I know is on the minds of many, our athletic departments at UNLV and UNR are in constant contact with the Mountain West Conference and are continually working with the governor's office and health experts regarding COVID-19 and how it affects our student athletes and our fan bases. And this has caused some difficult decisions to be made, as you all know. For example, UNLV football has canceled their upcoming game with Colorado State University due to positive tests and the contact tracing results. Another issue of concern or interest about NSHE is on-campus housing. NSHE institutions continue to employ risk mitigation options for residential housing and dining, which reflect appropriate health precautions, including the fact that we have greatly limited the number of students in our residence halls. And as we continue to provide housing to those who have housing insecurity when they are not on campus, such as foster youth or international students, in those inst instances, our institutions are making accommodations for our most vulnerable populations. However, I have also directed the presidents that no NCHI institution is allowed to evict a student from a dorm or housing uh, residence hall due to COVID-19 financial hardship. NCHI institutions are actively working with our students and providing resources th to those who are facing housing or food insecurity. On the subject of testing, we continue to have robust conversations about the efficacy of across the board testing of students at NSHE institutions. I am keenly aware of universities and colleges in other states that have engaged various such testing methods for their students. Currently, the recommendation of the NSHE task force is that we are limited in both the availability of tests and the resulting turnaround times to make widespread testing truly effective. Thus, we have not considered universal regular testing as a viable option at this time. However, I am interested in any available resources and communication with members of the governor's task force on how we might revisit this issue going forward. Particularly, NSHE campuses have interest in the BINAX test, which I understand allows for quick and near immediate results. I would appreciate any further insight you experts have into that possibility. Next, we are going to be turning our attention, as I'm sure you are, to a vaccination plan. With the hope of a viable vaccine on the horizon, we are very interested in partnering with all of you and all relevant agencies on delivering a vaccine to our students, staff, and faculty. The NSHE COVID-19 Task Force is beginning to have those conversations, and we would welcome your insight and partnership as your planning on this front um, unfolds. Finally, 
The year 2020 has been, in a word, truly unbelievable. We at ANSHI are ready to help our state economy recover from the pandemic and economic downturn. As during the Great Recession, many people will be looking to grow in terms of higher education, either to help them get ahead in their current role or to reskill into a new career by completing short-term training certificates. In the meantime, ENCHI and the Board of Regents will continue to work collaboratively with the governor's office and all local, state, and federal authorities to ensure that all of our students, staff, faculty, and visitors at the eight ENCHI institutions receive the best available information at pract and practices regarding the coronavirus to ensure the health of the entire public education community. And with that, uh, I will stop, Mr. Chairman, and take any questions that you all might have. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Chancellor Rose, and thank you for being here again. I know uh, just from what I'm reading in the newspaper, it's a, uh, it's a very busy week for you, and I know you have a, a lot going on with the eight institutions that you oversee. So thank you very much for being here and for providing that very thorough report. I just want to say a couple of things, and then I know uh, we have some members who can give some feedback on um, Binax and, and other issues specifically. Um, I just give some, some, some overall remarks here, and that is um, I've, I've been engaged. Uh, I was at INSHI when the, when the um, pandemic started and, and pretty quickly moved back to, over to the governor's office to assist in this role um, or a previous role, but a similar role. Um, and <clears throat> I know that um, INSHI has been a, an incredible partner from the very beginning. And just a few examples really come to mind right away. And that is Great Basin College out in um, uh, headquartered in Elko um, really set the standard in the state for contact tracing, development of workforce associated with contact tracing. Um, and that model was picked up by the University of Nevada, Reno, University of Nevada, Las Vegas as well to uh, assist with building that workforce um, uh, workforce for the state, which was which was remarkable, um, fast and 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 pretty much on the institution's own initiative. So um, that was a critical first step. Um, the Nevada State College, College of Southern Nevada, UNLV, um, have been deeply involved in helping develop test kits. Just the basic manufacturing. Not it's, it's not basic. I'm I'm a, I'm a history major. I, I don't know how to do any of this, but the chemists and, and lab professionals at these institutions have put together um, thousands of test kits for, um, for, our, for our state to, to really ramp up our test capability. And of course, Dr. Pandori and the Nevada State Public Health Lab is, is housed and uh, works through uh, the University of Nevada, Reno as well. I think we could all say there are just countless examples of the great work um, that your institutions have done. Um, I, I know that this is one, this is a crisis that requires a lot of adaptability and, um, and evolution over time. Um, you, you happen to join um, the team at a, at a, at a very uh, challenging transition point, I think, for the institution as far as um, being in the middle of a crisis in the pandemic and, and uh, having to respond. But uh, from for what it's worth, from my personal opinion, I think um, you know we had um, uh, Dr. Hug English uh, from University of Nevada on uh, two or three weeks ago and gave an excellent overview of the mitigation measures that the University of Nevada has put into place and the data expressing the effectiveness of those uh, those mitigation measures, which was pretty pronounced and pretty profound. Um, and and we know that uh, your as you noted, your other institutions are 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 taking that step as well as far as um, distance learning, which has already been in place. And, and we know it's just a, uh, um, a modification of that, um, of that existing policy. Um, but two things you mentioned that I think are absolutely critical um, beyond just how much, how grateful I am for your hard work and your, your institution's partnership and your personal engagement in all of this is, um, you talked about the mental health of your students and your faculty, and I know that's critical. Um, and you have some of the, um, the best uh, public and behavioral health minds in the state at your institutions. And I really commend you for, for doing that um, and, and putting that team together and, um, and, and really, really doing the hard work uh, necessary for that. I know um, at the state, 
through the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, we have uh, a number of um, experts who have been working with our K-12 system, and we have some K-12 um, representation on here as well, um, who may be able to support or provide input or at least participate in um, in your listening tour. And so I think that's that's excellent. And, and we would love to um, learn your benefit from your results as well. Um, so please do um, uh, please do keep us in the loop on that. And then finally, I, I'll just say um, the, the foresight that you're talking about right now in a, in a crisis, it's very easy to get very narrowly focused on just um, the fighting the nearest fires. And, um, and we all know that, um, I believe we all know that the economic impact is going to linger um, for longer than the, uh, the pandemic. We all, we all know that um, we will have to transform our workforce in, in order to meet the needs of um, the, the post-COVID um, economic landscape in the state of Nevada. And, and I just, your mention of that, again, some of the best minds in the state in those areas as well, putting uh, your efforts into that to help Nevada grow out of this uh, challenge, adapt out of this challenge we're facing right now, I think is critically important. And I just wanted to, those are all just comments and, and I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but I, I'm just, I'm grateful for your support to date and all of the great work you're doing right now and, um, and, and the, the uh, strategic um, vision that you're, you're taking going forward to help Nevada recover fully in, in the next, um, well, in, in the next long time. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, Director Cage, for the kind words and support. It means a lot. You, you obviously know us very well, better than most, because you came out of Enchi, and we appreciate the link that you create uh, for us um, and with us. I, I would just say on the matter of mental health, it was clear to me um, in some of the public comment that we received at our most recent special board meeting uh, that students have been very much suffering, whether, whether they had a change in pedagogy or not, uh, the kind of unexpected cascade of events that they have experienced this semester is something that we need to pay attention to and we need to listen and be responsive and you know I, I kind of liken it to um, as a as a runner I can just say I think when we all started down this road in in March which seems like three years ago uh, there was some hope that this would be a short acute event uh, and that we could take um, swift action and then go back to our business. And I, I think we all now understand uh, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And with a marathon, you, you have to have a different strategy around wellness, around burnout, uh, around listening and pivoting. Uh, and, and I'm so pleased to work with the group of presidents that I have who are incredible statesmen and women, um, and they have been working as a team, unlike any other team of presidents I've ever worked with before. And you all saw the debate and our announcement on grading perhaps uh, last night, that was made possible because of course the presidents retain authority over their grading policy as they should, uh, but they very much wanted to come together and speak with a unified voice. And I think this should be helpful to our students to hear that consistency uh, and to see leadership from those presidents as they lock arms to support students. So um, thank you for that. Um, I, I will, I didn't mention it in my remarks, but you will also be seeing some announcements from us around workforce. Obviously we have a role to play, particularly in the short-term certificates to get people job ready. Uh, and we'll be working with the new um, data that will be produced here in the coming weeks around workforce supply uh, so that we can make any changes to our certificates that would be helpful to Nevadans. So again, we stand out the ready. We wanna be partners to all of you. Um, I know it's a cliche at this point, but it, it, it's a cliche for a reason. I mean, we, we truly are in this together. So I. Very grateful for all of you and the opportunity to meet with you here today. 
Thank you. Uh, we are grateful as well. Um, I'd like to, uh, I know Melinda Southard is uh, on and I believe she had some comments regarding the, uh, or, or Melinda, can you make some comments regarding your work within She on Binax? Absolutely, thank you, Chair Cage. Uh, Melinda Southard for the record. So I just wanted to um, bring up an important note that you know, we are um, absolutely willing partners to um, work with Inchi and getting the buy next now out to those institutions. Um, we do have a meeting this afternoon with Dr. Hug English about that. Um, so we hope to uh, distribute those here very shortly um, in those institutions. So just wanted to let you all know that we're on it and uh, really appreciate the partnership. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the great announcement that you were talking about was was the uh, the decisions to move towards and I and I may get this wrong I apologize I I heard some of the the commentary at the uh, recent board meetings but the the decision was to move to uh, a satisfactory unsatisfactory grading basis for the next semester semester and a half is that right? Uh, thank you, Director Cage. Again, for the record, Melody Rose. Um, the decision, uh, so, so I'll back up just briefly and provide quick context. So last spring, when all of our courses went very suddenly online, uh, the board made uh, what I would refer to as a small policy tweak to give the presidents even greater flexibility around student use of satisfactory, unsatisfactory grade option as opposed to letter grades. And um, the, you know, not mandatory, it, it became a um, more flexible option for students last spring. And we had several thousand students out of 110,000 students uh, make use of that option. So not a whole lot of usage, but for those students who needed it, it was very beneficial. Uh, over the summer before my arrival, the, the chief academic officers from the campuses believed that it was no longer necessary to retain that flexibility because basically students knew the platform their classes would be in this fall. Um, and that is true. Uh, and again, uh, and she, I think, rightly followed the lead of the campus experts on this matter uh, and sat back and supported the campus level decisions. Um, but there's been a groundswell of uh, concern coming from students and others about uh, that needing access to that option. And so we recircled the wagons. Um, I've had a lot of phone calls uh, in the last week to try to come to a meaningful outcome on that. And the presidents made a decision that they would extend the option of SU grading through the rest of this academic year. Uh, and, and just to remove the uncertainty around that for spring semester, I think was valuable for students. Uh, and you know, I, part, of the, part of the trick in satisfactory, unsatisfactory grading, as you might imagine, is that you don't want students to jump in without good advising and prudent uh, information, both about financial aid uh, and about what can happen with scholarships, what can happen with grad school applications. We want these to be truly informed decisions on the part of our students. So I will say um, uh, kudos to the campuses because uh, implementing this option, it sounds like we would just flip a switch at ENSHI and students would have this option, uh, but the implementation campus by campus is exceedingly complex. And so just a big shout out to our staff and faculty uh, whose expertise we rely on to make that possible for our students. So uh, that's a little bit more, con more than you asked for Director Cage, but uh, hopefully gives folks some context when you read about it on Twitter. I, I, uh, I had a, a Twitter level understanding of it. So that context was extremely important and valuable. Thank you. It's, I think um, the balance between um, accommodation and um, the, the rigor that we would expect from our academic institutions and balancing that during a crisis is extremely difficult and challenging. And, and, and I think, uh, not that you're asking for my commentary on it, but I think that you're um, shared governance model there and student input and uh, institutional level 
um, authority has resulted in a middle ground short term. It's an option. It's not categorical across the board. Um, and uh, as in 110,000 students in an SU uh, um, status and all of that. So thank you. That's, that's clarifying. And again, I think it's just a, another example of how difficult this challenge is to address from a policy perspective, um, because we're talking about um, real services that, that people require in order to gain um, growth in the, in the workforce, uh, personal growth and, and all of those things. So thank you for all of that context. Any other members of the um, task force who would like to uh, offer questions or comments to Chancellor Rose while we have her here? This is Mark Pandori, the director of the Nevada State Public Health Laboratory, if I may, for the record. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to thank Melody Rose and also commend to everyone's attention the, um, the fact that uh, the University of Nevada, Reno, um, is the home of the Nevada State Public Health Laboratory. It's where we reside. And that in collaboration with the University of Nevada, Reno, we have been able to not only you know, provide testing during the course of this pandemic, but to contribute significantly from an intellectual perspective to the international knowledge on this virus. Um, it has resulted in five peer-reviewed international publications that were collaborations between the university and the state public health lab. So, it's one of the things that the uh, is really, if not unique, very close to unique about the Nevada State Public Health Lab that it has such a close relationship with its educational partner here and has been able to meaningfully impact the pandemic, not only through testing, but through these um, investigations and these, um, this sort of intellectual power that exists right next door and right under our feet. And I wanted to, again, commend that to people's attention and to thank Melody and UNR for that work. Thanks very much, Dr. Pandori. I think um, that's, a, that's a great comment to add here. And um, Chancellor Rose, I don't know if you have a, a, any response to that, but. Um... Um, thank you, uh, Chairman Cage, to uh, Director Pandori, again, Melody Rose for the record. I, I just thank you uh, for the partnership uh, as you say, research is such a vital component of the response. I think it's oftentimes uh, a, an underappreciated aspect of our response to the pandemic. Uh, we hope to learn from this in order to be able to protect our communities better going forward. So thank you for the partnership and, and the kind Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments from the task force for um, Chancellor Rose? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Chancellor Rose, for being here and, and making that presentation. Um, we are eager to partner with you going forward and in any way we can. And, and I know you know how to get, at, get in touch with us, but um, if you're team is distributing their weekly reports. Um, we'd love to be on the distribution list for that um, as you engage in your um, men, uh, mental and behavioral health assessments and, and plans. I know you've got some extraordinary folks there. We'd love to, to pro provide at least um, perspective and resources to that. And, and then of course, in the long-term economic development planning as well. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your hard work. We know you're making challenging decisions every day that affect a lot of lives and uh, directly and indirectly through their families. And uh, we're just we're grateful you're here in the state of Nevada. And, uh, and um, we, we hope we can, we can welcome you more fully after a vaccine here and, uh, and really enjoy getting to know you better. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair, you're on mute, sir. I actually hit the button each time. Thank you, Wesley, appreciate it. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we will close out agenda item number four and go to uh, agenda item number five. We added these updates back, um, uh, even though we do have a, a, a high number of um, plans to go through today, my, my goal is to really just overview the, uh, the changes in the plans and um, um, uh, have discussions at a high level here based on where we are in, in the two week period the governor announced. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Director Reynolds to provide a 
brief update on um, the activities of BNI, business and industry. Thank you, Caleb. Uh, real brief, we have uh, we've continued doing our inspections, and as you know, we've eclipsed um, over ten thousand inspections, and we have uh, responded to over five thousand uh, complaints and referrals uh, through to OSHA. Uh, but that's not really one of the issues. I want to highlight some of the the concerns that we have um, in the last couple of weeks, and and our staff was has been working with the local enforcement teams, both in Clark County, Washoe County, and uh, in the Quad County, Carson City area. Uh, our concerns really in Southern Nevada are with construction and what we're seeing is a little slippage in terms of we had good compliance with a lot of our construction projects uh, in Southern Nevada. We're getting good compliance in Northern Nevada in, in construction, but I would ask the uh, construction associations, contractors, and builders associations in those areas to remind their membership about uh, mask wearing, social distancing, and, and working to uh, help out so that there isn't a spread of cases within their construction jobs. And so that's extremely important for them to realize. The other area that we're seeing, and this is the time of the year, uh, is big box uh, stores who are not really following the existing protocols for capacity or not monitoring that as well as they should. And so we're seeing a lot of heavy gatherings. Uh, normally we would see this time of the year because of the hol holiday season, but we would ask that they uh, monitor their capacity within uh, these big box stores. And that's something that I think the local governments can also help us with in reminding uh, during this time that they stay within their existing capacity limits and, and monitor that. So those are the areas that I think that are important for us. Uh, we're gonna be going out and, and working with um, the uh, different enforcement teams, both in, in Washington and Clark County um, that have large uh, box stores and making sure that uh, people are uh, and store owners are complying and making sure the managers are aware that they need to be monitoring their capacity within that. Uh, the other thing that we've been doing is we've been working with, and I know we'll get into this discussion because we've had that with the local health districts. Uh, we've been uh, re monitoring and reviewing uh, adult and uh, youth sports plans. Uh, and we've uh, really done a, a lot of uh, approvals, review and approvals of those uh, literally hundreds of them. And so that's one of the things that we're also concerned with is making sure that we're cognizant of the gatherings within these spectators and making sure that there is um, some limitations on that. There is social distancing um, so that we don't have large gatherings with these these events. So that's something that we're, we're very conscious on and we've been reviewing and had discussions with uh, the, both health districts in regard to that. So uh, those are the things that we are working on now uh, and the concentrations that we'll be looking at uh, within the next few weeks. So with that, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Director Reynolds. Any questions from the task force members? Okay, thank you very much, Director okay. Reynolds. Thank you. We'll go now to uh, We'll go now to Chief Fogerson. Good morning, everyone. So Division Emergency Management Homeland Security Office has got three big pushes in this uh, incident. The first one is uh, coordinating of resources to make sure that all local government and the state government are all talking and working together. Second push is for logistics. And the third push is for grants. Uh, on the logistics side, of the, on the coordination side, we're doing daily conference calls now since the governor did the 2.0 uh, ask for people to stay home. We've been checking with every local jurisdiction once a day to see how the mitigation efforts are going and what the trends are working with. On the logistics side, we've been helping to push out the Buy Next Now kits that uh, Dr. Southard spoke of earlier. And we're working on two different warehouses, stockpiling the, the different personal protective equipment that's gonna be needed for our first responders and our hospital staffs, our home health agencies and our skilled nursing facilities to take care of the folks. Uh, we have received uh, free to us supplies from FEMA that the local government's request and we're sending that out this week. The school supply should be out within the next week as well. We also have a 120 day surge supply 
that was bought with grant money and CARES Act money to make sure that it carries us through when we hit this new surge that we're starting to see the uptake on now and, and facilities are asking for equipment. The only linchpin in there or a big linchpin is gloves. Gloves are a national wide shortage. Right now we have about a 30 day supply into the 120 day supply. Everything else is either 120 days or really, really close to 120 days. And on the grant side, we're actually working on 90 different grant projects for different local governments and the state government agencies, totaling up approximately $131 million in that area there. So all of those balls of wax all fitting together, trying to make everything work together for everyone. In the report, open for any questions, sir. So Chief Ogerson, Dave, uh, thank you for the update on, on grants. I'd like to continue including that. The recovery piece is huge. You said uh, about $130 million in recovery grants. Um, and, and I just wanna make sure everybody understands uh, the significance of that. Can you talk a little bit more? That's not uh, uh, grants to, um, to build new programs or uh, anything like that. Can you talk about the, the nature of the PA program and, and how those work? Absolutely, it's kind of a misnomer name. They're called public assistance grants, but the public part is for the public sector of the government, not for individuals. So the public assistance grants are for local governments and state agencies who have had to uh, purchase items or make uh, have issues that they need to resolve because of the incident. And right now, uh, FEMA does reimburse 75% of it, and then we have 25% that's a local match. Uh, the governor has submitted a request to FEMA and to the president to change that from a 75-25 to a 90-10 split. So we would have uh, less money out of our state coffers, less money out of our local government coffers, and, and more money coming in from the feds to assist with all those purchases that we've made. And this is a reimbursement grant. And so local government, state government, they're all out this $131 million. And this is now us working to try to get that money to come back in to fill the holes. And some of this goes back to the beginning of the pandemic back in February when we started this. And this is kind of the way forward right now because it, our CARES Act funding ends December 31st. So after December 31st, uh, the only process to get any money to sustain our, our programs will be through the public assistance reimbursement program through FEMA from our declared disaster. Thank you for that. And, uh, and, and just to uh, reiterate something I always have to, to remind folks, these, these um, reimbursements can take years uh, and, and often do take years. So it's a, it's a long haul, uh, but it is, it is a reimbursement. So thank you. Anybody have any questions or comments for Chief Fogerson? Great, thank you very much. We'll go to um, Leslie Mullenkamp to provide a fiscal update uh, from the governor's finance office. Hi, good morning. Leslie Mullenkamp with the Governor's Finance Office. Uh, we have um, we have been very busy the last couple of weeks. Um, as you all know, the uh, our main source of federal funding, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, um, uh, has a, the end of its performance period is December 30th. And so we have been working diligently to um, uh, allocate some of the remaining dollars uh, that we have. And uh, we've been working with um, Department of Emergency Management to see if we can find some solutions and, and uh, funding options for some of uh, what's needed for the surge and maintaining as long as we can through the end of the year. Um, we also have been working on a few other initiatives related to uh, homeless assistance, um, childcare uh, assistance, uh, also surge resources, there's a, a variety of uh, items related to that. We are looking at um, turnkey connectivity options as well. Uh, we have a few proposals um, related to that and uh, which would help with remote learning and uh, connectivity with that. And then we also have a, a few other uh, initiatives we're looking at with economic assistance. Again, keeping in mind that these all have to be very turnkey options because at this point we have a very limited amount of time to use the funds. So uh, we've been uh, very busy with that and um, finalizing some really uh, key initiatives that I think will uh, be beneficial, especially with the search going on. So that concludes my report for now. If you have any questions, I'm available uh, to, to help answer. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, so just want to point out something you noted uh, and, and was noted incorrectly previously. You said the uh, CRF, Corona, Coronavirus Relief Funds, 
have to be expended by December 30th. And I know it's a it's only 24 hours, but I would hate for people to uh, to miss any deadlines because they think it's December 31st, and that is a common um, that's a common perspective. So appreciate you clarifying that. Um, I know we have a couple of projects that are under consideration uh, right now for for potential funding. Uh, and, and there are a whole lot of um, others going on out there. So I'll get with you offline to, to see where we stand on those, but really appreciate your, um, your work and, and effort to make sure that we're maximizing the use of these, um, these resources. Does anybody have any questions or updates or comments for- uh, Caleb, this is Leslie. Terry Reynolds. I've got, a, I've got a question for Leslie. So it came up on our staff and discussion uh, is the, uh, the funding has to be um, basically utilized by December 30th. But what if um, funds are contractually obligated and there's a contract signed to perform work and that uh, contract goes past December 30? Can that happen or does it have to end as of December 30? So this I think is one of our largest challenges right now. Um, there are very, very strict requirements on, on the fund. Um, as we all know, uh, I don't think any of us anticipate that on December 30th, this will suddenly just vanish into thin air. So I think we're all pretty aware that this is going to be continuing on past the 30th. However, the funding is very restrictive in that whatever it is that's purchased, the goods or services, they need to be executed by the 30th or before the 30th. And in certain situations, they actually have to be put into use. So uh, an example of that would be any kind of connectivity or construction project, something like that. Not only does the equipment have to actually be purchased, it has to be installed, but it also has to be in use. So those can, that can be quite a challenge, especially where we're at right now. Um, related to um, it carrying over, there are some, some situations where something may carry over past that December 30th date, it usually has to do with purchasing something in bulk. And that would be either uh, bulk, bulk items or bulk services, essentially. So there are some exceptions there. I would recommend that whatever that specific item is, um, we could definitely uh, chat offline and, and I could uh, review that and just let you know if, if we see that being problematic or not. Now, this was brought by housing. It was in context of rental assistance. And so mm -hmm. there are um, approved programs for that, but they were concerned that whether that, um, if somebody was approved and they, and they hadn't got the, uh, the check yet or they hadn't got the assistance yet, whether that could continue past, even though it was authorized, whether it could continue past to be able to, to get that money out. So that was the context and we can discuss that yeah. later. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think you bring up a really great point because grants in particular um, are they do have a different type of function in that once the funds are, have gone out to the recipient, um, that is a different situation because you, you have technically executed what it was intended to do, which is to provide that assistance to a citizen um, prior to the 30th. So again, yeah, definitely we can clarify it and make sure one way or the other. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? Thank you for that, Terry. Thank you very much, Leslie. I appreciate that. And thank you for uh, taking the time to be here as well uh, for these important updates. I'd like to go now to the uh, Nevada Department of Education and discuss uh, and get an update from Deputy Superintendent Felicia Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair Cage. Felicia Gonzalez for the record. Um, just a quick update. Uh, in September, the Nevada Department of Education partnered with the Teachers Health Trust to provide a COVID testing program for all public school educators and staff in our state, funded by the CARES Act dollars. Currently, nine school districts and the Charter School Authority, as part of their mitigation efforts, are participating in the TIES COVID testing program. This program also includes monitoring and retesting of educators and staff and does conclude on December 30th. That is the end of my report and I am available for questions. Great, thank you. Any questions from uh, members on this? I know we've had some announcements during our meeting about some decisions at the school district level. I presume we'll, we'll hear more about that uh, later, but appreciate the update from the, uh, the department level here today, Felicia, thank you. 
Chief Black, are you, uh, do you have any updates from the Gaming Control Board? Good morning. Thank you, Chair Cage, uh, Jamie Black, Gaming Control Board for the record. Uh, nothing to report this week, really, aside from the fact we are currently transitioning in a new chair who officially started yesterday. And I just want to take this opportunity to publicly welcome Bryn Gibson to the Gaming Control Board in his new role as chair. And that concludes my comments. Thank you very much, Jamie. And please uh, welcome, welcome Bryn back to state service uh, for, for us as well. Thank you. Any questions or? Thank, you. Thank, thank you. you. We'll go now to um, Nico is uh, Director Stapleton on. I believe she is at a conference this week. Dagny, are you here? Okay, we'll go to uh, League of Cities and um, Director Harper. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Cage. Uh, just wanted to uh, inform the task force that uh, the League has started to contact uh, each member city uh, to emphasize business inspections and compliance rates. Certainly we know that cities are working through the counties uh, in order to um, cooperate with regional plans. Uh, but we, we've been reaching out to our members directly on that to emphasize inspections and uh, get an understanding of their compliance rates within their municipalities. We've also sent out communication about the COVID trace app. Thank you, Julia Peak. Uh, we are encouraging municipalities to um, have asked their employees to encourage their employees to download also the businesses that they are inspecting to download and encourage people doing business with those municipalities to download and customers of the businesses that we are inspecting to download. Um, end of my report, Chair Kate. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, Unless there are any questions or comments from for uh, Mr. Wesley, we'll go to Dr. Lake with the Nevada Hospital Association. Great, thank you. Um, as everybody is well aware, um, the hospitals are seeing increased demand, uh, primarily in the uh, metropolitan service areas in the north and the south. Uh, some of the hospitals are also experiencing some staffing challenges. Um, these are related to staff members uh, and staff family members um, catching COVID or being exposed to COVID uh, through the community, through community spread, and then needing to be quarantined or uh, self-isolated for a period of time. Uh, hospitals are also uh, working with uh, traveler organizations to get uh, traveling nurses, essentially. Um, those are becoming harder to, uh, to come by now and much more expensive as far as those contracts as a, a good portion of the United States is uh, competing, if you will, uh, for those limited resources. A um, couple new therapies are out uh, and are available in the hospitals. Um, basically, an antibody therapy was released last week. Um, it is uh, being administered now in hospitals uh, throughout the uh, Nevada. Um, and uh, aside from that, uh, we are constantly working on the uh, vaccine distribution plan with the state and encouraging uh, patients who have recovered from serious COVID disease to uh, consider doing a plasma donation that helps with the fabrication of the antibody therapy. So um, with that, I'll end my report. Thank you very much. Um, anybody have any questions or comments regarding Dr. Lake's report update from the Nevada Hospital Association before we go to the current situation report? Okay, great. We'll close out number agenda item number five and we'll go to agenda item number six. Um, and um, uh, Kyra, if you could um, provide us your update now, that would be great. Thank you. Just give it a second for my slides to pop up. Thank you. So for the record, uh, this is Kyra Morgan. I'm the state biostatistician for the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, this slide as usual, oh, thank you, is <laughs> showing uh, just really trends across cases, hospitalization and testing Nevada is now experiencing increases in um, all three of those cases, hospitalizations, and tests as well. 
comparing it to our last task force meeting uh, over the last 14 days, we've averaged 1,228 new cases. Last week, that number was 969. Even more um, telling for our trends is that the seven day average is above 1,600 new cases a day. Um, and so that number we do anticipate to keep growing at a pretty alarming rate. We're averaging six daily deaths to Nevada residents. Uh, last week when we presented, it was five. And then testing is quite a bit higher as well, uh, 324 tests per day per 100,000 over the last two weeks. Um, comparatively, that was 295 in the last task force meeting. So we are seeing that as we um, continue to have large spread in the community, it's actually driving our testing demand up. Our test positivity rate, however, is also really alarming at 15.6%. This is the highest that we've seen um, ever in the state of Nevada, sustained over a 14-day period. We have had um, individual days that have reached higher than 15.6%, but to sustain that over a 14-day period, it's the first time that we've um, done that in Nevada. Uh, daily new cases are now regularly higher than the previous peak from July and August. And regionally, Nevada is outpacing Arizona, Arizona and California in our cases per 100,000 residents. Next slide. Here, um, we're just looking at trends in hospitalizations. Similarly, uh, we have exceeded our previous peak in hospitalizations in Nevada. Nevada data are outpacing modeling forecasts for general hospitalizations, but not for critical care hospitalizations. So that's an important differentiation to make. More folks are hospitalized, but we haven't uh, exceeded our previous peak for folks in the ICU or needing mechanical ventilation. And then you can just see the trends at the bottom of the screen specific to Northern Nevada and Southern Nevada, um, really telling, as I mentioned last week, just the disproportionate effect that we're seeing in this wave in the Northern Nevada region. Next slide. Here again, we're looking at that test positivity rate. Um, as I mentioned, it looks like there's a discrepancy on this slide. It's 15.6%, uh, not 15.4. Um, really the takeaway here is just, um, again, it's higher than it's ever been, which implies community-wide spread and potentially many more undiagnosed cases in the community. Next slide. Here I wanted to um, throw in some additional information. Data continue to confirm the benefits of non-pharmaceutical interventions um, really across the board including masking, um, you know, maintaining social distancing and other non-pharmaceutical interventions. A recent inter uh, international study that was published in The Lancet found that public events bans were associated with the highest reduction in the effective reproduction number. And then um, just as a reminder, that effect effective reproduction number is essentially uh, the number of people that will become infected by a single infectious person. So RT is currently estimated to be approximately 1.2 in Nevada, which means that on average, each person in Nevada with COVID is infecting 1.2 other people. When RT is greater than one, COVID spreads rapidly. When RT is below one, infections tend to slow. And there's a chart there on the right-hand side. Um, this one is from COVID Act Now, but um, a bunch of models are, are really following that same trend for RT. So you could pick any of them and plug it in there. Uh, it just shows over time, you know, where we've been and kind of where we're going and puts us right now in the high zone, uh, which definitely is not ideal. I've also included on this slide a tool that recently came out of Georgia Tech, uh, which is called the COVID-19 Event Risk Assessment Planning Tool. And there's a link um, available there as well. The tool shows the risk of attending an event given the event size and location. The risk level is given um, as an estimated chance between zero and 100% that at least one COVID-19 positive individual will be present at, at an event given the size of an event and again, the location. So if you go to that link, you can actually um, pull up any county in the United States and get county specific data. Um, the table below is looking at the state as a whole. And there are different assumptions made um, based on the number of cases we think we actually know about through uh, a positive test. Um, the middle column is the current reported incidence times five, which is actually a pretty, um, conservative um, estimate of the number or percentage of cases that are undiagnosed. And based on that, you can see, even if you're att attending an event with 15 people, there's a 28.5% chance that one of those people is COVID positive in Nevada right now. If you attend an event with 50 people at least, there's a 67% chance that there's one COVID positive individual in that group. If you attend an event with 250 or more people, 
there's uh, virtually 100% chance, although there's never 100% chance, so they say greater than 99% chance uh, that you come in contact with, a, a, not that you personally come in contact, but that you're at an event, one of those 250 people is COVID positive. So that's just, I think, a, an interesting tool that's come out and an important conversation as we reach the holidays. Next slide. Here is just the standard slide um, for turnaround uh, time on testing. Still, Nevada's holding at two-day average in general, but there are significant different differences um, across different regions in the state. This time, we've limited the data here to be since October 15th. Um, last time I presented, it went back to October 1st, but just want to make sure that we're looking at most recent and relative data. Next slide. And then here again, I've just included um, that difference across uh, different counties of the state. So again, you can see disproportionately in some regions, um, testing turnaround is taking uh, quite a bit longer than, than others. The graph at the top really just shows the distribution statewide. So interpretation there is that 23% of tests um, are reported in one day, 41% are reported in two days, 17 in three days, et cetera. Uh, next slide. And then jumping right into the county tracker, um, here's our comparative snapshot from November 9th. Uh, next slide, please. And then here we are based on data uh, from Monday, November 16th. Um, as you can see, all but four counties are now flagged for elevated transmission. Um, some of those rates are actually very alarming. All counties that are flagged are being uh, flagged for having a high number of cases per 100,000 uh, and high test positivity. I think Lincoln is the only uh, county, oh wait, Esmeralda and Lincoln, it looks like are also flagged for um, just low testing numbers in general. It's important to um, highlight that these data include prison cases. I know we've had a lot of conversations uh, with the local jurisdictions about uh, the importance to be able to differentiate that. Um, currently, like I said, these numbers do in, uh, include prison cases. We are able to adjust that to exclude prison cases. Um, in specific instances, or if, if folks are interested in looking at that, we did do a preliminary analysis, um, I believe it was Sunday of this week or last week, um, which looked at if we were to exclude prison populations in general, how it would affect the counties related to their transmission levels um, here. And there were some significant impacts. Um, there were five counties that were significantly affected. And I could go into more details if, if wanted, or I could send those out, or we could talk about them next week, whatever this group prefers. They didn't affect the numbers significantly enough to actually move a county in or out of elevated disease transmission. So the counties that are flagged remained flagged when we removed prison cases, um, but there are some populations that are significantly impacted by prison outbreaks currently. And then the next couple of slides, um, kind of as usual, show those trends over time. Uh, this one looks at te the testing per day. One thing that I think is important here is that um, as we see the disease spread faster, we actually see um, less folks not meeting our testing threshold, which um, tells us that finding more cases and having a higher test positivity actually does drive folks to get um, tested more often. Sometimes we talk about how numbers are increasing because testing is increasing. I think this shows that it works both ways. When cases increase, we also see an increased demand for testing. Um, the next slide, uh, please, looks at cases per 100,000. Um, here's tells the opposite story, right? You can see, um, again, just more and more counties being flagged as having significant cases um, in their population. Again, this is normalized to population density. And then the next slide showing test positivity rate. Again, alarming just to see um, how many counties are being added to this um, you know, this list as far as coming back with a, a really high test positivity. I believe that's all I have today, unless there are questions. Uh, I think I think we certainly will have questions and discussions on this. This is Caleb Cage again, for the record. Um, Julia, are you on? Are you able to provide an update on? Oh, I see you there. Can you provide an update on uh, contact tracing um, before we open the floor to discussion? Absolutely. Um, so as of yesterday, we've identified a total of 30,465 of our cases through our traditional case investigation and contact tracing. That represents now 24.3% of the total cases reported to date in our state. Um, we again remain really steady at about a quarter of the cases being identified through this me method. So that means, you know, three quarters or 75% remain just general community spread, not I linked to a, another specific case. Um, as you all know, we've been using surge staffing 
for uh, reaching out to our contacts since mid-June. Um, what they do is they make that initial communication with the close contact and then uh, talk to them about the quarantine requirements and then check in with them daily through that period of time. Often that's done through text messaging. Uh, since starting again in mid-June, there have been a total of 197,172 calls made to close contacts. Um, a huge number want to acknowledge that. Uh, related to our COVID Trace app, we've we now have a total of 95,743 downloads as of last night. So I just want to pause and acknowledge everybody who's been pushing that method out. Um, it's a great way to identify uh, close contacts um, when the individuals may not know each other. Uh, so since implementation, there have been a total of 36 cases that had the app at the time um, of their diagnosis. As a result of those cases, there have been 31 exposure notifications sent out via the app. I do want to take some time tonight, today to note that the importance um, of our residents adhering, if they're a case, to the isolation requirements and if they're a contact to the quarantine requirements. By not following those requirements, you are putting those around you either at work or in the community at risk of infection. So I, I again just want to emphasize those. Um, also want to note today that our chief medical officer, Dr. Eisen Azam, released a technical bullet bulletin this morning reiterating that CDC and no Nevada do not support the test-based strategy for ending self-isolation of cases. According to CDC, in most cases, the test-based strategy is no longer the method of choice for that discontinuation. Uh, so it should be used only if the individual was instructed to do so by um, a clinician. Otherwise, um, we're hearing a lot around the state that uh, employers are requiring negative tests for employees to return back to work after uh, their period of infection. I would encourage them to go see that technical bulletin, which will be available on our website, and it explains uh, the appropriate way uh, that we recommend to have employees return back to work. Again, it's not the test-based method. With that, happy to take questions. Director Harper, go ahead. Let me speak. Uh, thank you, uh, Wesley Harper, for the record. Um, we've been uh, communicating with our cities about uh, encouraging the use of the app. We have had some um, hesitancy, uh, concerns about privacy, and perhaps uh, having cities be uh, responsible for HIPAA violations. I uh, figured I'd bring that to you in this forum for, for your response. Yeah, first, thank you so much for um, pushing this out through all of your avenues. Um, on our website, the NV Health Response website, there is a really nice discussion of privacy. Um, through the app, we collect nothing. We don't even collect if it's a Nevada resident. We don't collect if you've been identified as a possible exposure and close contact. It's totally confidential. Um, the only thing that's exchanged between the devices is the Bluetooth tokens. Again, we cannot track those back in any way, shape or form. Um, the way that we identify cases is during the disease investigation process. We talk to them about um, having the app installed. If so, we're able to provide a code. We're looking at some options to do that outside of disease investigation as well. Um, but that's the only time that somebody from the health department will be talking about the app and or have um, any information on if a, if a case or contact had the app. Uh, we don't get any information again on those who have been notified they've had an exposure. So if the individual gets the exposure notification, it tells them where they can go and get tested. It talks to them about um, the need for quarantining for that period of time. That's between the individual and their phone. We get none of that information. I appreciate it, uh, Wesley Upper, for the record. And all this is on on your on the website there, and I can direct cities that have this concern to that place for that information. Please, yes, and I can provide that to you directly. Thank you, appreciate that. Thank you for the question um, and, and response. Any other discussion regarding either the situation in Nevada or the um, uh, update on contact tracing? Okay, uh, Julie, I just wanna say to you, uh, I wanna echo um, your comments regarding your team's implementation. I remember early on when this seemed like it was never going to be doable um, because of all of the, the different barriers. Um, but um, Tim and, and your entire team have just been 
amazing at pulling this through. And I've been noticing lately that the numbers are increasing in much larger chunks now from two, uh, two to 3,000, 5,000 increase yesterday in downloads. So it's starting to um, pick up steam. And that doesn't happen just by, uh, just, just by chance. That's the private sector task force that's put a lot of uh, energy, time, resources into this. And then the, the public sector partners uh, through your office and others to do that. So uh, I, I've downloaded it. I've uh, uh, acknowledged my COVID case through that and um, know that it worked. Um, we, we have had some people, and this isn't uh, meant to, this is just a process comment. We have some uh, folks who have said it's taken, uh, it's been challenging to get the codes from the health district in order to put their case in. And we know that that happens during contact tracing. My hunch is that we're behind in contact tracing across the board and that's, that's slowing that process down. So not meant to be a criticism, but I know that's, a, that's an actual uh, concern that's been brought up a number of times. Pivoting from contact tracing back to um, uh, biostatisticians, uh, Kyra's update, um, I think it's very clear where we are. And I want to just contextualize that data that uh, Kyra provided for all of us a little bit for, for our purpose and our use at the task force. We have um, uh, 13 of the 17 counties who are on the list right now, so to speak, who are on the elevated risk uh, list. And that is, uh, that, that is indicating a uh, increased community spread. And as Kyra pointed out, if we're we're seeing those numbers, then it's uh, it's probable that we're not seeing numbers in the community because uh, we're obviously not testing every case. Uh, we're certainly not testing everybody, every asymptomatic person. Um, so what that tells us again is a trend and uh, the trend right now, every trend is climbing in the state of Nevada. And um, this is, uh, this is a, a, the reason that the task force is um, established is so that when uh, counties, communities across the state are on that list for uh, two weeks in a row, then we start to have a conversation with them and we start to have that conversation now. And, and we start to identify what those issues are with, um, as Kyra pointed out a moment ago, the uh, incarcerated populations within counties, which are, are state or uh, are, are different populations than just um, uh, other types of community spread. And there are other considerations for, uh, for those and in other institutional settings like skilled nursing facilities and otherwise. But to really begin that conversation and see what are the mitigation measures that the local community uh, wants to put in place? What are the uh, enforcement measures that the local community wants to put in place? And what resources and support can we provide from the state? Um, we've had an ongoing uh, conversation regarding the, um, we've had an ongoing and, impressive, uh, and, and important conversation regarding the, uh, the difficulty with um, the turnaround times. We know that the two-day lap reporting time that we're getting here is different from what is being experienced on the ground, and I look forward to providing you an update on where we are with that. Uh, that's, a, that's a challenge uh, for the state. We also know that these resources, many of the federal resources or allocated resources to date are coming to an end at the end of next month with uh, National Guard um, duty only approved through the end of the month with a two week uh, demobilization process. We've got the CARES Act, the CRF Act dollars that are uh, must be expended by December 30th um, and, and all of the other um, support mechanisms that are in place. So we are in a critical time right now as you all know, the governor uh, did a press conference about, I wanna say it was about a week and a half ago, saying in two weeks he would make a, a decision on where we were. Um, cases have, have continued to, to climb and that's, that's just the, that's not unexpected necessarily um, because of where we are in the, the, the evolution and the process of this virus spread in our communities. Uh, but today we need to um, have that discussion and see um, see how we can help uh, with the expectation that the governor is going to be making an announcement in the next week, I'm guessing, make a decision the next week um, that would, uh, uh, would, be, would, would be a statewide decision for, um, for uh, the mitigation measure, measures that we have. So right now, when we get into the uh, county updates, I really want to focus on, uh, because we had 
eight of the nine, or was it seven of the eight, um, eight of the nine counties who are represented today um, had approved plans last week. Um, some had some approved with modifications. Uh, what I'd really like to do is um, bring these, these counties forward and um, talk specifically about, uh, oh, thank you, one moment. Sorry, working from home, challenges continue. So uh, what I'd really like to do is uh, focus on the, um, what the changes were to those plans, if those changes uh, were implemented and, and any state needs uh, from there and to really just move through those quickly um, so that we can let you all get back to your schedules and uh, your days. We know that you have uh, board meetings and others that you need to get to as well. Brooke, Brooke. Sorry, I thought I was muted both times. Um, so right now I'd like to go to, um, we'll start with Douglas County and uh, begin with, um, uh, I believe Patrick Cates and Chief Carlini are on. If you guys could um, give us an update for, with uh, where you stand from Douglas County. I know you have um, some other meetings you need to get to today and, and uh, this is your first week on. So please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Patrick Cates for Douglas County. Um, so this is our first invite to the task force. Um, I'd be lying if I said I was happy to be here, but it is good to see a lot of familiar faces from my time at the state. Um, I, I look forward to the discussion and any input that this body has for us. Um, you've read the report. I know your time is limited, but this is our first report. So I won't go through the whole thing, but I do want to highlight a few things for you. Uh, first off, Douglas County is part of the uh, Quad County Healthcare Coalition. Uh, Carson City Health and Human Services serves as our public health agency. Uh, Jeannie Freeman, uh, Public Health Preparedness Manager from Carson City Health and Human Services, and Todd Carlini from East Fork Fire District, acting as our county emergency manager, are also on the call to help with questions. Um, as of Tuesday, uh, the most recent data that was available, we had 498 total cases in Douglas County, 32 active cases, and two deaths. Uh, just for reference, Douglas County has a population of just shy of 50,000 people. Uh, average number of tests per day, um, as of Monday, we were at 307. This is a good number. Uh, we were lagging on tests in September and early October. Um, but we really did a lot of uh, communication, public service announcement pushes on that, and mixed up some of the locations, and we've been seeing good, good results from testing since then. Um, the uh, cases per 100,000, that's one of the items we've been flagged for. Uh, we were at 447 as of Monday. Uh, the test positivity rate, that's been elevated for the last three weeks. Uh, as of Monday, we were at 13.4%. So it's those two metrics that we've been flagged for. It's been the last three weeks that we uh, uh, have been bidding, uh, hitting those, those measures that um, cause us to be flagged. Um, we've been doing a lot of robust uh, public information campaigns throughout the emergency. Uh, we have put out our own material, a variety of formats. Uh, we have amplified both Carson City Health and Human Services and the state has been putting out uh, we have a very active uh, social media presence, and um, that's one of our chief means of distribution, as well as the, the normal uh, media outlets. Uh, like, uh, like a lot of the state, and in particular in the rules, we've been challenged with a lot of compliance fatigue. Uh, when we do put out our, our social media posts, we've been getting a very high volume of, of negative responses. Um, however, having said that, I would point out that Douglas County has... Uh, as some of the oldest demographics in the state. We have a very large senior population. Um, so despite a lot of negative comments on social media, uh, what we have seen is that compliance among our citizens um, to state directives and CDC guidelines uh, remains high. So, um, you know, there's definitely some people that uh, have a lot to say, but in general, I think people are complying uh, well in this county. Um, most recently, we put out a press release on Monday uh, that I personally penned quite a bit of. Uh, we talked about 
our numbers, uh, how we were being flagged by the state that we were completing this assessment, talked about its impacts on the healthcare system. I think they were all good on point messages. What I was really pleased with when we put that out on social media, we did get some of the usual negative comments, but that was uh, more than offset by positive comments and people engaging with those negative commenters. Um, I haven't seen that in months uh, to that degree, so that was very encouraging. Um, I think people are recognizing uh, the data um, in the governor's press conference on the 10th. I think people um, are taking that to heart uh, despite some continued communication challenges. Um, the county implemented a COVID-19 preparedness and response plan back in May. Uh, prior to that, we had people out of the office entirely, but we formalized it in, in a plan. We've been updating that with every change in state direction, directives or CDC guidelines. We're requiring masks in our facilities for employees as well as the public. Uh, we are doing remote transactions as much as possible. We put in a queuing system at our offices here where we um, uh, to, to try to minimize the amount of people uh, that are in here at one time to maintain social distancing. Uh, all of our in-person senior programs have, for the most part, been canceled. Uh, instead, they're doing deliveries and remote care for seniors. Uh, and that's been ongoing for months. There's, there's nothing new there. Um, after the, the governor's press conference on the 10th, where he talked about the stay-at-home 2.0, uh, I met with all of our managers in the county and elected officials, um, encouraged them to step up telecommuting, which we've been doing quite a, quite a bit of anyway, but we kind of started to normalize it and had some people coming back in the office. We put that in reverse, told people to report from home. Um, uh, we're trying to separate staff in this teams, really emphasizing the message to stay home if, if people are ill. Um, the Douglas County Sheriff's Office has recently changed their protocols as a result of these changing uh, uh, metrics as well. Um, they are now requiring face coverings for uh, peace officers whenever they're interacting with the public and in the offices. Uh, prior to that, they were following the CDC guidelines for peace officers, which uh, was discretionary uh, regarding face coverings and, and that sort of thing. Um, we continue to work with our two chambers of commerce and the business council to engage with businesses. Uh, we've distributed PPE. Um, and, uh, and we also implemented a small business grant program to help businesses not only with PPE costs, but um, working capital as well. Um, we do have some challenges with enforcement. I do know that that is a, a big concern of, of this committee, uh, uh, rightly so. But Douglas County is one of the few counties that uh, does not have a business license. We have two code enforcement officers for the entire county. So we don't have a good framework that a lot of the larger jurisdictions have um, to use that as a mechanism for enforcement. Uh, however, having said that, um, the sheriff's office routinely uh, responds to complaints and, and goes to businesses and uh, engages in education on the protocols. Uh, lots of education, as I said before, public information campaigns. Uh, one of our particular challenges has been uh, Lake Tahoe. Uh, so we've been partnering uh, to do messaging of the lake regarding tourists. Tourists, we saw a whole lot of tourists during the summer months, especially when things were locked down in California. Uh, that was a real challenge for us. So we've been doing a lot of messaging around that. Um, other enforcement activities, the, the Carson City Health and Human Services hotline, they do have a process where... Uh, uh, if people are calling and, and it looks like there's issues with uh, compliance with the directives for businesses, they are referred to OSHA. Uh, we also get health inspection services from Carson City Health and Human Services, and they have some protocols as well for COVID when, when they go out on their um, uh, inspections. Uh, and, and again, a lot of education. Uh, most major events have been canceled um, in the county. Uh, we've been reviewing events with emergency management or public health officer or referring to that, referring those events to the state, uh, mostly business and industry, if that's appropriate, given the, the, the governor's directives. Um, we currently have a couple of events that are planned. Uh, there are holiday events for Gardnerville and Minden uh, in early December. We're looking at those. Uh, those were planned to go forward. 
They have a lot of protocols in place. It's outdoors. We don't expect more than 250 people. However, in light of where the demographics are, or where, where the metrics are going, uh, we're taking another look in, at that and, and we're going to be making a decision soon about whether those should go forward with modifications or be canceled um, entirely. Um, those are kind of the highlights. Again, I know uh, time is of the essence, so I, I didn't want to go into too much detail beyond that. Uh, happy to answer uh, any questions. Thanks, Patrick. I'd like to open it up to the uh, members of the uh, task force to see if there are any questions um, regarding the update we just received from Douglas County. Um, Caleb, this is uh, Richard Whitley, Director for Health and Human Services. I just, um, just a, a question of clarification, Patrick. Um, is the, I think you might've said this, but, and I've been away too long from public and behavioral health to recall, does the Quad County um, uh, cover environmental health for Douglas? Um, gosh, I should know the answer to that. <laughs> uh, I know Todd Carlini's on the call. Maybe if you can help me with that. <laughs> or Patrick, this is Nikki. I'm on the call. Would you like me to address it? Please, please do. Okay. So for the record, Nikki Aker, Director of Carson City Health and Human Services. So yes, we have a contract be with um, Carson City and Douglas County to provide environmental health services and that is the restaurant inspections and um, yeah Mr. Kate talked about that in that um, the um, there is a protocol that they follow in during those inspections. Great thank you. Thank you Nikki thank you Richard any other uh, questions or comments um, regarding this update here? Chairman Cage, Dave Fogerson. Yeah, go ahead. As most people know, I came from Douglas just uh, a few weeks ago to the state service. And this plan, I, I think, is a good plan. And it fits. I know what they've been doing. I know that some people beat them up at times for their community and some of the, some of the statements that come out of their community. But I can tell you with all honesty, I know Nikki Aker, Jeannie Freeman, Chief Carlini, and Patrick Cates and Melissa Bloss are all working very hard on this. And, and I just want to publicly acknowledge that, that I recognize the, the, str the struggle they're in, just like we hear from Jeff Page and some of our other rural communities on the political divide and the expertise and the dedication that our public safety and public employers have uh, does not go beyond me or does not, uh, does not not seen by me. So I I've lost, it. yeah. Thank you, Dave, I appreciate that. Um, so I, I see all of, all of the, uh, the, I agree, I think everything is here. Um, let me just ask, um, are you uh, recommending through this plan any increased mitigation measures uh, in your um, community, um, Manager Cates, um, or are all of these in place right now? Um, I, I would say all of those are in place right now, uh, with the exception that we're just redoubling our public, um, uh, public service announcements. Um, and, uh, and, and and not approving events going forward that we may have done, you know, a month ago when our numbers weren't as high. Okay, and do you have any uh, recommendations for mitigation measures that the state might put into place, given where we are statewide right now? Uh, I do not. I don't know if uh, Carlini or Freeman has anything to add. Todd Carlini, for the record, um, no, I, I I really don't. I think you know we're 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 certainly like I think the majority of counties, um, you know, and we're we're doing what we can. Um, I want to thank uh, Chief Ogerson for um, you know his comments and uh, recognized uh, you know the effort here, uh, and I want to comment that uh, prior to his departure and and engagement with the state, uh, he played a significant role in um, putting a lot of what we have in place today uh, and what is, I think, represented here to a, to a great degree in terms of, of our approach and our response to the, to the pandemic uh, was, was, was really carried upon his back. And so 
um, I guess it's a, a kind of a, an opportunity to exchange a, a compliment back to him with respect to that. Thank you. And, and we'll have that stricken from the record, of course. Um, but uh, we do appreciate the comments and, and glad to have uh, Chief Fogerson up here uh, at state as well. Um, so any other comments or questions from members of uh, the, the task force here? This is Richard Whitley again. I guess I would, um, I, I, I can do this, I guess, on my own with follow up because I don't think it's fair to ask of, of them um, in, you know, without, without any ample sort of opportunity to pull the information. But I just am curious if without local business licensing, like what Carson City finds with, uh, that's fines, F-I-N-D-S, fines with their environmental health inspections of food establishments. If, and then if there is a finding, like what's done with that? And I, I guess I just, I'm not aware of if, if there are any issues of compliance in that, in that area or not. So maybe I can get that from Carson City um, if that's if that's public information. Uh, Richard, this is Nikki. Um, I have not um, heard of any big issues at this point. Um, you know, they um, of course when the inspectors go in, if um, if they are seeing anybody not wearing mask or anything, they will address that. But I was just asking. Um, an inspector yesterday, what they're seeing, and he feels that um, he sees that most people are wearing masks. And, you know, they also have the lake, so they have the casinos, and there's many different establishments within the casinos. And he said that they have very good compliance. Good to hear. Thank you. And Mr. Whitley, this is Jeannie Freeman, just to follow up on that. Early on in the COVID outbreak, we had some issues with a couple of different uh, food establishments within Douglas County, and our investigations worked very closely with them related to the spread within their establishments, and were able to collaborate, and they were all very receptive to that feedback. Great, thanks. So I... I um... Thank you for that, Director uh, Willie. I think it is that is an important piece to all of this. So, um, you know, one of the things I want to I want to point out is we do have. Um, I know it's political, but we did have a, a, a political rally um, that received a fine, and there was a, at the at the airport uh, recently. And uh, I, I do recognize the politics of the county and and how um, challenging that may be. But I I, I want to encourage you. Um, as local leaders to, um, to, to understand how those sorts of events undercut any positive under uh, public messaging on public health um, going forward, where if it's okay uh, to go to rallies and uh, to participate in, in those sorts of things across the board, um, then that, that are in defiance of or that are defying the, um, the guidelines, even the federal guidelines, um, then, then those that that doesn't reinforce a message in the long run. So I just want to point out that that it looks like the majority of your plan is relying on messaging, uh, and that's that's challenging. Um, I know this is the first. I believe this is the first week that, and, and I think you said this, Patrick, that um, that Douglas County is on there uh, is on this list. This will will likely not be uh, the last week based on what we've seen before. Although we have seen counties come on and come off. Um, so um, where you are right now uh, with, a, with an elevated positivity rate and an elevated case rate, um, you know, we're, we're the, these numbers impact the state. And as, uh, as Manager Page said last week during the meeting, um, you know, a lot of the rural communities outside of the, the major communities have impact on those uh, hospital numbers in Washoe and Clark County as well uh, because of transfers and um, some reason to believe that, um, uh, as we saw yesterday, um, Dr. Lake, I don't know if you can correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but uh, we saw an, a, a pretty significant increase in hospitalizations in, in Carson City that correspond, or the uh, Quad Counties, that corresponded with 
uh, an increase in number of cases in, um, in Washoe County. And so uh, although um, this, this, this is political and, and unfortunately political, um, we, are, we are a state with fixed state resources. And so we gotta make sure that um, we're working together to, to protect those and make sure that when people are sick and need hospital care, we have the space available, preferably not space in, in a tent or uh, an alternate care, alternative care facility uh, which is where we're headed right now. So, uh, with with uh, Renown in particular in their um, uh, their parking garage issue. So, uh, I'll, I'll also say with the statewide numbers um, going where they are, um, I you know my recommendation would be to to approve this plan with the understanding that uh, without mitigation measures um, taken, uh, we're going to have to recommend or I'm going to have to recommend. Um, statewide uh, mitigation measures in order to ensure that we can get these um, the spread of these cases under control and um, and so that we can ensure that our uh, vulnerable populations are protected so people are not uh, contracting the virus unnecessarily and uh, uh, and so we're not um, diminishing and depleting our hospital resources to include the, the personnel who are working there so uh, unless there's anybody, else who would like to make a comment on any of those uh, points or any of this, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, move to uh, approve Douglas County's plan. And uh, like, we, like we do with, with everyone, I wanna see uh, a, a, an additional, you know, an update to this plan um, with um, fo increased focus on enforcement um, in the future. So I'll, I'll make that motion and uh, see if anyone else uh, has any thoughts on that. Caleb, Terry Reynolds, I'll, I'll second that motion. Uh, and I'm going to make the same comment with all of, the, all of these plans is this that we really are uh, diligent in making sure that we're adhering to the capacity limitations that are set in the directives on our, uh, our restaurants, retail areas, because we're seeing more incidents within those areas. And so I'm hoping that uh, the local governments are really cognizant about the capacity limitations, especially in big box stores or grocery stores that mm -hmm. tend to have a lot of people gathering in them. That they're uh, making sure that they're set up to be able to handle those people, that they keep the lines, the social distancing, uh, the things that are set forth in the existing guidelines. So, but with that, I'm happy to second this plan. Thank you, Director Reynolds. Uh, any, we have a motion and a second. Is there uh, any additional discussion at this time? Chair Cage, Dave Fogerson. Yeah. I'm going to okay. abstain from this first vote on Douglas's plan since I was heavily invested in some of the development of it back in my employment with them. I don't want to have a conflict this first time around. I won't have a conflict in the future, but I think this first one, I'd feel better stepping out of the vote to start with. Uh, I have no personal interest, no monetary interest, but I just don't want to have coming immediately from that jurisdiction and then voting upon their plan. I don't want anybody to think of anything with that. Thank you for noting that. Um, uh, and is there any other discussion? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of approving the Douglas County plan, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed vote no. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you to Douglas County for being here and we'll look forward to seeing a uh, more built out uh, enforcement plan in the future. I'd like to go to um, Washoe County now um, and, uh, and, and address the, uh, any updates to um, your plan. Again, we're specifically looking for um, any updates and changes to the plan um, um, or uh, recommendations to the state. Uh, or, or requests for resources from the state that need to be addressed. So if we have um, Washoe County Manager or Health Officer Dick on. Yes, good morning, uh, Chair Cage and members of the task force. This is Kevin Dick, District Health Officer for the Washoe County Health District. And uh, as Kyra or Ms. Morgan uh, mentioned, we uh, do have an alarming uh, number of cases and levels of disease transmission occurring in Nevada and in Washoe County. And we're continuing to see ours increasing. 
Um, we had a record uh, 610 new cases that we reported yesterday. Our positivity rate has increased since Monday to uh, now 17.8%. Uh, um, uh, our our seven-day moving average is at an all-time high of 409 new cases per day. Uh, to normalize that against the peak that uh, Clark County hit earlier in the year when they were searching, we're at about 170% of that level uh, uh, based on uh, per capita or population. The um, hospitalizations have uh, continued to increase in Washoe County. Uh, not too long ago, we were looking at 40 to uh, 50 uh, hospital, hospitalized for COVID-19 and we're at 234 as of the last report uh, from the Nevada Hospital Association of confirmed cases and other 50 uh, suspected uh, cases. So our, our hospitals are certainly uh, feeling the strain uh, at this point and our hospital administrators are becoming quite concerned about uh, what they anticipate coming their way of additional cases in the future based on uh, the high rates that we have, not just in Washoe County, but uh, across Nevada in the counties that form the catchment area uh, for our, our hospital system, uh, our healthcare system, and those hospitals. Uh, so the, uh, we're, we're continuing um, to, to see the increase, and uh, I believe that uh, we need to do something. Uh, yesterday, uh, Ms. Morgan distributed the, the paper from uh, Lancet infectious diseases that she touched on briefly uh, in her presentation, but I, I want to um, go back to that because I think it's quite significant in that it is a uh, peer-reviewed assessment of uh, mitigation measures that were taken in 131 countries during the first uh, six, mo six months of the year and looking at what the impact of uh, those measures were on effective transmission rates. And we know we need to get our transmission rates down below one in order to see a reduction in our numbers and get uh, COVID uh, under control. And what that study found was that the, the single measures that had the greatest impact in reducing the transmission rate was uh, uh, to uh, limit uh, public events and, and public and private gatherings to 10 people or less. Um, and we know uh, from that study and, and the results of it, uh, there's you know, it's an evidence-based, science-based approach to looking at what could be an effective uh, uh, action to take. The study also looked at um, multiple mitigation measures and the impacts that would come from those. And so uh, as you add other things on top of that limitation of gatherings or public events, uh, the, uh, the transmission rate could be reduced further. So there could be additional steps that would, would, uh, could be taken. But I think it's important to look at where could we get the, the biggest result uh, and benefit from actions that we take. And so um, this was only provided uh, to us uh, yesterday. I'm very grateful uh, that, we, that we got that and that uh, Ms. Morgan caught that uh, publication. But uh, so I haven't uh, had a chance to um, engage all of our local leadership, et cetera, in uh, th this discussion. Uh, but I think it is significant. I think that we do need to, to move toward uh, limiting our gathering sizes further uh, to no more than 10. And uh, also as far as an ask of the state, um, with the uh, concerns that we have uh, from our, our healthcare system, I would ask for renewed efforts uh, to work on recruiting uh, medical personnel through the uh, Battleborne Corps uh, as the, uh, the hospitals are, are really looking for assistance with staffing that they're uh, needing as the, uh, they're surging their operations to meet the, the uh, demand that's uh, being placed on them. And I believe Manager Brown is, is on, on the call, so I will uh, turn it over to him as well for, for his uh, update. Thank you, Kevin. I am here. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. All uh, right, so we're joined this afternoon also, I believe, by uh, Manager Kruitz from uh, Sparks, City of Sparks, and Rebecca Vines from um, 
city of Reno. I, I, I will say uh, in terms of what's changed uh, Chairman Cage in the last week, other than uh, the, the spike in numbers, um, I do think that both uh, the city of Sparks, city of Reno have uh, significantly stepped up their enforcement efforts uh, that is reflected in the report. And I'll let them speak to that more specifically. Um, having said that, um, I can tell you all that um, uh, because of the elections that took place a couple of weeks ago, uh, I had the opportunity to actually visit about 20 of our polling locations around the county over the last uh, couple of weeks. And in, during those visits, I actually took the opportunity to, because many people didn't know who I was. Uh, I was just some crazy guy out uh, at the polls asking questions. And I would ask them, um, their point of, points of view on um, COVID compliance with wearing a mask, social distancing, what's going on at their businesses. I don't think this is an enforcement issue. I think enforcement is important. I think we would be in far worse shape if we didn't do enforcement. But the behaviors I am seeing and that people are disclosing to me are just flat out bad behavior or COVID fatigue. I don't care. Uh, I'm going to have people over to the house uh, for my Halloween party. The the school that got closed, uh, Reed High School over in Sparks, uh, and I think the health officer can confirm this, one of the parents disclosed they had a Halloween party with over 150 people. Makes no sense. Uh, I think we reported a week or two ago that there was a Halloween party in bird eye out in northwest reno over 500 kids showed up sheriff's office had to break that up those are the kinds of behaviors that that are, go beyond our uh enforcement efforts in the bars restaurants retail establishments and again i'm not speaking against doing those um but um the overwhelming uh i guess uh kitchen table evidence to me suggests that's where our problem is, and uh, I don't know how we do it. We're, we're trying to ramp up our public uh, outreach campaign now that the election is over. We've expanded it uh, to all of the major broadcast affiliates in northern Nevada, uh, ABC, NBC, CBS. Um, it has gotten uh, a good re uh, response in the Latino community. Uh, we're using uh, our local Latino uh, on-air personalities to help expand the message. Um, those are the things uh, that I guess I, I would share in, in terms of our efforts around mitigation and ramping up. Um, and uh, I, I want to applaud the other two managers uh, the, from City and uh, from Reno and Sparks in that uh, we are significantly increasing the media weight uh, against those campaigns. Because we, we all believe that, that the messaging and the convincing of the target audiences to do the right thing is one of the most important things we can do. Last thing I will say, and then I'll turn it over to, uh, to uh, Neil in Sparks. Um, if there's anything that can be done, we, we still have not been reimbursed as a uh, incident management team for the FEMA thing, uh, uh, real, uh, expenses that we've incurred as, a, as an incident command team. And we're coming up on the end of the year, as you all know, if we don't um, get resolution to that, um, it will force us to make some hard decisions about uh, whether we use CARES Act funding for those expenses to make them go away or how do we handle those. Uh, so I, I can talk to you, Chairman Cage, about that offline, but I'll, I'll turn it over to um, uh, Neil, if you're on, from uh, Sparks. Good afternoon, Chairman Cage and members of the of the committee. Neil Cruz, Sparks City Manager, uh, kind of echoing what, what Eric said, we have stepped up our, our inspection and enforcement activities in Sparks, and in the coming, the coming weeks, we anticipate seeing those go up even more through a combination of internal staff reassignments and bringing some contract resources to bear. So we look forward to being even you know, more embedded in the, in the community on a recurring basis. Uh, as, as is included in the report you know, of last week's inspections, we did, find, uh, we did find four violators of no trend in those violations 
locations. One was a restaurant, one was a gym. One was the Greyhound bus stop that we have down in Victorian Square. And then the last one was a small local uh, coffee roaster. So we're not we're not picking up those trends, but we will certainly be mindful of Director Reynolds' uh, you know, guidance on uh, on the big box retailers and the, and the grocery stores and, and, and paying attention to the capacity there. So that is certainly something we will focus on going forward. And with that, if you don't have questions, or if you do have questions, I'm sorry, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, otherwise, I'll turn it over to uh, Rebecca Venus. Thank you, uh, Manager Kurtz. Good morning, Chair Cage and Task Force members. I'm Rebecca Venus, Director of Neighborhood Services with the City of Reno. And I just wanna thank you also for giving us a chance to talk about our mitigation efforts these past few weeks. Um, what we have seen as case counts are continuing to increase in Washoe County, if you look over the past week, the rate of increase has slowed as compared to the previous two weeks that we've seen in Washoe County. I think that speaks a little bit to the increased efforts that we have seen between the three entities in terms of enforcement. Uh, the city of Reno specifically has significantly increased enforcement efforts. In the past two weeks, we've completed almost 500 inspections with a 97% compliance rate. This is a 300% increase in inspections and represents 4% of the total storefront and in-person customer base businesses that we have um, in the city of Reno. In terms of testing, we are working in partnership with Renown the Washoe County School District and the Nevada National Guard. And we'll be hosting a mobile test site this coming Sunday at Wooster High School. We'll have a limited number of tests, but they will be available to residents at no charge with no appointment required. And our goal really is to get those results back to families of um, Wooster students and Corbett Elementary School students before the Thanksgiving holiday to help encourage them to make the right decisions as they come into the holiday. Um, we do continue to support the regional campaigns that uh, Manager Brown referenced. We've been working very closely with some of our Hispanic consultants and a group of students at the journalism school at UNR. They conducted a survey on campus of students to ask you know, how they felt about the disease, what kind of actions they were taking, and exactly to, to what Manager Brown referenced, about a third of those students indicated they have no concerns about contracting the disease, um, and they're not afraid of transmitting it to family members because they're not living at home. And so we're working with that group of students to create some campaigns on alternate media platforms to to reach out to students and try to convince them not to be going to these, these activities and these events. And we'll continue to work on those projects um, going forward. Uh, we are committed to partnering, you know, working with our regional partners with the health district and the state task force uh, to do what's necessary to keep both the community safe, but also try to manage a balance to be able to keep our businesses open as well. So with that, I thank you. And I will turn it back to uh, health district officer, Kevin Dick. All right, uh, thank you. I'm not sure I have anything uh, further to add. I guess one update uh, people might have seen that uh, the, this morning uh, the Washoe County School District uh, posted their uh, agenda for the upcoming meeting uh, happening on Tuesday and the school superintendent is uh, now recommending that they go to full distance learning after the Thanksgiving break. Uh, through the Martin Luther King holiday. So um, I know that's a, a difficult decision that the, the school board will need to be making, but I, I support that recommendation based on uh, the level of transmission that, that we're seeing right now. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Chair Cage. Thank you very much. Um, so I see at the, uh, at the end of the plan, there's, a, there's the recommendation you mentioned about the 10 person or less. And I just want to clarify um, that is a, uh, a recommendation for the governor's consideration. Uh, so I got two questions on that. That's a recommendation. That's not a, uh, a request for um, the task force at this time. Am I understanding that correctly? That is correct. Okay, thank you. I appreciate so I that. Muted. Oh, um, no problem that's a, at all. That's, yeah, that's a recommendation. Thank you. It's a recommendation and that's that's a it's recommended by the health district, but that's supported through the county as well. 
honestly, Chairman Cage, the, the jurisdictions haven't had a chance to bet that with the elected officials, so I can't make that commitment. Okay, understand that 100%. Thank you. Um, so we have an approved plan here and um, and a recommendation. Appreciate the recommendation here. Uh, we'll make sure that uh, makes it up. I don't. We don't need a vote on this. Um, does any member of the task force have any questions? Or um, Chris Lake, go ahead. Great. Um, this is uh, pretty much for for the whole group that uh, spoke. But as we start uh, looking at uh, you know possible uh, mitigation measures again. Um, I was wondering if following the last set of uh, closures or mitigation methods or methods or, and, and controls that we put in place, did you have any untoward effects uh, for, towards population health, um, such as housing insecurity or food insecurity or any other untoward effects that maybe we should take into account as well? I, uh, I don't know if, if uh, Manager Brown wants to respond to that. Uh, I think the Human Services Agency has more exposure to that. Uh, yeah, we we have seen um, uh, impacts. Uh, we did see impacts, I should say, from the closures. Um, but honestly, uh, and I, I, it's interesting you asked that question because um, uh, Amber Howell, who runs our health human services agency just shared that information uh, with the commission earlier this week. Um, I don't know that we fully understand the impacts because uh, as we shut down, the reporting also uh, suffered in terms of uh, volumes and that kind of thing. So uh, I'd be happy to send you or, or the task force uh, her analysis in terms of um, suicides and behavioral health issues uh, in that space. Um, but I don't know that you could look at those numbers objectively and say that because we shut down, um, we saw a spike in, in um, behavioral health or, or other uh, related crimes. But again, I'm not sure we, we know what the, the full impacts are at this point, if that helps. Happy to share the information though. Great, thank you. This is Neil Cruz from the City of Sparks. If I can, if I can tag on to that, uh, in, in talking with the, the police chief here in Sparks, when, when we went through the shutdown starting in March, we did see an increase in, in domestic violence in our, in our city. Uh, we also we noticed, and I, and I think this bears out across the county, an, an increase in the size of the homeless population. Certainly as unemployment went up, uh, you know, there were more people losing their homes than there than there were before. So, you know, kind of painting with a with a broad brush, we we did see impacts with the with the broad economic shutdown that uh, that we all had to suffer through uh, at the beginning of this. Thanks. Thank you for that question, Dr. Lake. Any other questions, comments from uh, members of the task force? Yeah, this is Terry Reynolds. I just I wanted to uh, echo what uh, Manager Brown said. I think that there has been uh, good compliance generally across the board, and really commend you know Reno Sparks and Washoe County for the work that they've done to get to that point. Our compliance numbers show that you know things are actually going fairly well and. And what we're doing really is kind of reminding businesses at times to, <clears throat> to uh, you know, to comply and what they need to do. And after doing that, you know, we're seeing you know, in most instances, you know, 98 to 100 percent compliance. Uh, I would reiterate, though, I think that you know, ga indoor gatherings um, is still an issue. And I think you know, just as uh, <clears throat> Manager Cruz said, if they can monitor and look at um, their big box. Uh, stores and uh, and grocery stores and keep within the capacity limits. I think that'll help too. But I, I I agree with you know Manager Brown's assessment in terms of what is happening from a community and and uh, incidents where there's large gatherings and and that has kind of rippled through the community to create uh, additional cases. So I think that's important to realize. Thank you, Terry. Any other comments from task force members? Melinda. Yes, uh, thank you. Melinda Southern for the record. So I just wanted to comment on the Battleborn Medical Corps. 
Um, we are working with the Joint Information Center with the State Emergency Operations Center to push out additional messaging, um, requesting people to sign up um, to volunteer. And uh, we do have a robust registry and do continue to push out the messaging that volunteers are needed and follow up on all um, requests for volunteers for you know, hospitals and healthcare facilities and the like. So just wanted to bring that to, to light that we are working that process. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Any other questions or comments for uh, Washoe County? Okay, seeing none, thank you uh, for the recommendation, Washoe. I know we'll be um, uh, providing that uh, to the governor here very shortly um, for, uh, for his consideration as well. So appreciate you making that recommendation. Um, let's go on now and uh, bring up Clark County. Clark County has an approved plan. Uh, our only uh, request last week was to incorporate the, uh, uh, the, the, the decision-making model from the health district into the, the county plan. Um, so if we have uh, Chief, uh, I see Chief Steinbeck is on here, Chief Samuels, anybody from Clark County who can provide uh, an overview of where you stand, any significant changes and any um, recommendations to the governor for consideration for mitigation measures statewide and any resource requests, we'd appreciate it. Good afternoon, Chair Cage, Billy Samuels for the record. Um, the main difference that we've had this week from last week is that we did set up that community-based collection site over at Texas Station, which was in one of our top 10 zip codes um, for higher elevations. Uh, with that higher, with that um, testing site being in the higher elevation zip code, we obviously expect to receive higher positivity rates. Um, and, and that is what we're seeing. So again, we're gonna see our rates go up, but we think that's important because now people are knowing that they are positive if they were asymptomatic. And now they can make those rational decisions to isolate and, and quarantine themselves. So hopefully, you know, we can stop the spread that way by letting people be informed that they have been uh, tested positive. Hospital capacity is, is obviously, like Dr. Lake said, I think everyone knows is, is increasing. But I did have a, my scheduled weekly call with them on Tuesday. And they're, they're still staying. They're stable between ICU beds, licensed beds, and staff beds. Um, so they, they do feel comfortable there as well, along with medications um, and equipment. They, they do revert to the same thing about staffing as well as that everyone else has heard up from the north. So thank you, uh, Ms. Sutherland. If we can keep working on that Battleborn thing, that'd be great. And any other avenues, either through EMAC or whatever else we need to do with other states to make sure we can get um, some staffing relief for, for, our, um, for our workers in the hospitals. For as far as business license and enforcement, um, we're going to continue to follow the recommendations from Southern Nevada Health District. And I did put that on this plan. Um, and Misty Robinson is on this call as well, so she can um, talk about that when I get to there. Um, the efforts that the county is going to focus on for business licensing is uh, through country clubs, the banquet halls and sports. That's where we're seeing some of the, um, some of the issues taking place. So we will be addressing that. Um, and then after that, I'll let Misty talk on the Southern Nevada Health District side. Hi, this is Misty Robinson with the Southern Nevada Health District. Um, unfortunately, today we reached a milestone by uh, surpassing 100,000 total cases. Um, regarding our safe gatherings uh, plan, currently our seven day average of COVID positivity rate is greater than 8% and the seven day average of new cases is greater than 750. These two parameters are approaching or exceeding surveillance capacity based on the criteria uh, outlined in the SNHD evaluation and large gathering plans guidance, as well as um, what is enumerated in, um, in Chief uh, Samuel's report. Um, therefore, SNHD is not recommending that large gathering plans be approved at this time. Although gatherings of 250 or less will not be submitting plans for review, SNHD recommends limiting of gatherings to 50 or less. And it looks like that will be the case for the next couple of weeks. And I'm happy to take any questions. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Chief Samuels, did you have any, any more to provide? Uh, no, sir. Um, report says it all. You, you guys have read it. I'm not gonna bore you guys with uh, reiterating my report to you. Okay, so uh, Caleb Cage again for the record, just same question for you that I've asked um, the other jurisdictions. Do you have any recommendations uh, for the governor's consideration as we uh, for mitigation measures as we close down this 
uh, as we move into this two week period here? Um, we, we do not. I think with the health district's recommendations for nothing greater than 50 is, is doing a, a good job. And I think that's going to help um, solidify some of our, our things coming forward. So we do not have any recommendations for what the governor's office should be doing as far as uh, either rolling back or um, making any further um, announcements. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, Clark County's plan is approved and we appreciate you updating it uh, with the with the information we requested. Does anybody, um, um, does anybody, any other, <clears throat> excuse me, any other members of the task force have any questions or comments for Clark County? Christopher Lake, I do if uh, you'd so indulge. Go ahead, Chris. Great. Um, do we... Do we have any idea the percentage of compliance with the uh, the people that test positive, uh, perhaps the asymptomatic people that test positive um, related to the quarantine or the self-isolation? And is there any kind of enforcement effort on those people to uh, ensure that they self-isolate? Dr. Lake, this is Billy Samuels. Um, I, I think if you're asking if, if we can guarantee that people are actually staying home or isolating after they test positive, I don't know if we have that capability to to basically track people that way, so to speak, um, unless Misty has a better way of doing that. So I would say that we have so many cases right now, there's no way that we have enough staff that can monitor um, every single one of those cases. Um, we are not, uh, you know, we're doing our regular case investigations and um, and going through our contact tracing processes. Um, and so our, uh, disease investigators are, are trying to identify those um, folks and where, where they've been and where, you know, if they're uh, symptomatic or asymptomatic and all of that. But I, I don't see any way that we could with our current staffing and the current caseload that we would be able to um, enforce isolation and quarantine orders on people. Great, thank oh. you. Dr. Lake, this is Billy Samuels. I think this is the time for a question. And is there is there a a um, platform out there that does that? Uh, Billy, uh, Chris here. Uh, I, I'm not sure of that. I was just uh, I was just curious. Um, we we talk a lot about enforcement on the business side, um, but I was wondering if anybody was out there uh, trying to make any kind of enforcement on the quarantine or isolation side, um, which seems to be uh, possibly part of our root problem as well. So. You guys are doing great work though. I don't, I don't want to indicate otherwise. Thank you, sir. We appreciate that. We, uh, we're always open for suggestions though. Are there um, other questions or comments for Clark County or Southern Nevada Health District at this time? Okay, thank you, Clark County. And uh, we appreciate your, uh, your work and um, we will, uh, um, continue to, to work with you on these, these issues. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to go now to um, uh, Nye County and, um, and see if we have uh, either um, Mr. Sutton or uh, Scott Lewis. I see you just unmuted. Scott, same questions for you. Um, yeah. Any significant uh, changes to your plan that's already been approved? Any questions or sorry, any um, any recommendations that you would have for statewide mitigation measures and uh, any resource requests specifically? You know, the majority of the information that we provide in our report is similar. We've taken some additional steps, obviously. We've uh, taken a uh, format that the Southern Nevada Health District has used and incorporated into our report. So therefore, we're reviewing just about every uh, proposed event that occurs within the county. The county has closed the, the uh, county government to public access and remote working from home. We recognize probably the biggest issue that we're dealing with is what was mentioned earlier in this conversation is the behavioral aspects. And I'm just wondering if there's a behavioral messaging that can come from state behavioral health that could assist us in getting those PSAs that will drive home the fact that uh, how important that is. Um, we have a lot of suicide related issues per day in Nye County in general. And we're seeing a significant uptick in those as well. So I think we need to uh, redirect some of it from, a, I think what was mentioned eloquently stated was that get away from 
the enforcement piece a little bit because I think we're doing a pretty decent job on that. It's, it's all down to the individuals now and, and what their behavior and, and what, how that's driving our overall uh, lack of success in this. As far as real quick on the hospitalization, we're strained. Tracing and investigations is strained, and I think that's a positive word considering. And we're investigating. We're over a thousand cases in Pahrump, almost 1,100 in Nye County, and we just had another uh, probably 20 some cases that have come in since the beginning of this call, including another death. So we're open to suggestions. Our PSAs are being prepared. We're following the state recommendations on those PSAs. Um, it's trying to hit those target audiences, especially with the upcoming holidays, as everyone has recognized. I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Scott. Um, we've got Director Whitley on and uh, Chief Overson on. Um, I know that we have, I've had discussions with um, Dr. Woodard and others uh, recently regarding, or not recently, in the last six months, uh, regarding uh, the behavioral health side. I know there's a number of um, uh, messaging and, and campaigns associated with that. So I'd ask um, uh, Chief Overson and uh, Director Whitley to, um, to, to follow up on that and, and see if there's any uh, outreach that we can assist with, specifically not on the behavioral health, I'm sorry, on the, on the uh, behavior uh, regarding um, mask utilization and that sort of thing. Absolutely, I'll follow up with the jig. Thank you. Um, other questions or comments from members of the task force? Okay, thank you very much, Chief Lewis, and uh, we'll be uh, um, following up here soon. Look forward to talking to you uh, shortly as well. Thank you. I'd like to go now to um, Humboldt County. Do we have anyone on from Humboldt County? Good afternoon, this is Nicole Maher. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. I am the public information officer for Humboldt County. I am stepping in for County Manager Dave Mendiola, who had to step away for a bit. I would just like to present our updates, as you might recall. Last week we presented, and we weren't flagged last week, but we had been the two weeks before. We are currently flagged. Just to give you a quick update concerning Humboldt, um, November, as has been the case with the rest of the state, is, is certainly our highest month. We've had 80 new cases since the beginning of the month, which puts us at about 4.4 cases a day. That compares to about 1.6 cases a day during our previous highest time. We currently have 56 active cases in the Fort McDermott um, Reservation, which reports separately from us. They are currently at 136 cases and 20 active cases there. Uh, currently, five Humboldt County residents are hospitalized, four locally. No ventilators are in use locally and no patients are in ICU locally. And our PPE remains good. So let me address our county city enforcement, which um, was a request of the task force uh, last week, and we're happy for the opportunity to to share uh, the result of of our discussions and and our our um, our updates here. So early in Humboldt County's fight against COVID nineteen, our Humboldt County Health Board established uh, what we called the Humboldt County Business Educator Program. So in April and May of this year. Um, this group of county and city officials worked with local businesses and organizations. We used mail and phone, and, and we also made some in-person visits to answer questions and address concerns and make recommendations uh, for a more comprehensive on-site uh, mitigation. And starting Monday, this past Monday, we reinstated that program. And so we're going to use, uh, obviously, our our goal is to make sure that um, our businesses are contributing to the solution and, and organizations as well um, and, and certainly not detracting from it. And so we're uh, planning to use uh, various tactics, but uh, here's just a couple. I'm going to send out a letter to all businesses in Humboldt County outlining the expectations 
for um, business and organizational virus mitigation measures. We're going to include a, a media campaign that's aimed at reminding retailers and consumers to work toward a COVID-free Christmas. We have an email address that will allow citizens to ask questions, address concerns, um, make recommendations for heightened virus mitigation measures. That was really effective in the early days of this for us, and um, we're hoping that will continue to be the case. We will provide notice to individual businesses and organizations <clears throat> regarding complaints and request a written plan for solution. And then we will follow up with individual businesses and organizations that receive complaints to ensure accepted solutions are in progress. So the, the county and the city, as, as uh, is the case with, with most rural counties, don't have the legal ability to restrict um, smaller gatherings that fall under the, the, the current rule. But the Humboldt County Health Board is in the process of launching a public relations campaign that will focus on the idea of gifting health and protection to others during the holiday season by not only gathering in ways that maximize mask wearing, social distancing, hygiene efforts, but preparing for that. And we, um, we think that's, um, it's a good idea. We also recognize, as has been the conversation here uh, earlier this morning and, and just recently this afternoon, that um, these public relations campaigns only go so far. People's ears are, are somewhat closed, and yet we will continue um, to, to try to, to share and, and do so in, in different ways that might engage them. And in addition to the, the tactics outlined above, um, Humboldt County's business educator program officials will make observations. Now we're going to start at a minimum of 10 Humboldt County and City of Winnemucca businesses each week. We're just starting to ramp up this week, and, and our goal is to eventually get to 20 of those walk-ins observations each week. Uh, we want to ensure that those businesses are following required protocols um, we want to, um, to to note again that businesses that are found out of compliance will be noticed, asked to submit a written plan for solution, and, and again, follow up to make sure those accepted solutions are in progress. Um, while we've just recently reinstituted this program, um, in April and May, we actually um, are not shy about saying that 100% of businesses complied with all suggested solutions. Now, we also understand that, that some of um, those folks may have uh, changed opinions since then about um, the disease or uh, mitigation measures, and, and, but we, we still are very optimistic that we will see great compliance um, as, we, as we work through solutions. Um, so as far as just our, our county action plan, I just wanted to touch real quickly on, on just four items that have kind of updated since last week. Last week, we talked about improving testing turnaround times. And um, as we noted last week, our, our test results have been taking about uh, 10 days to come back, seven to 10 days to come back, which uh, greatly hinders that contact tracing process. So last Tuesday, Humboldt County began sending samples to Quest, a private lab, and, and we've been promised that tests will now be turned around in 48 to 72 hours. Today will be the beginning of that uh, test period, and so we'll see. Uh, we're excited and see how that will positively impact those, those tracing efforts. Um, the other update to our plan is just about reinstating that, that business educator program and excited about that, about launching that uh, public relations campaign. And then, um, as has been mentioned earlier, we also will be, um, I think it was when we were talking about um, the state educational system, but we are also working on a draft vaccination plan with the goal of moving forward with um, Tier 1 vaccinations in Humboldt County and working with the state and, and with the community health nurse um, to deliver that. So. Um, hoping that that can be sooner rather than later. Just also wanted to, to mention and thank uh, Melinda Southard. I just received 
kind of a string of emails uh, where she is responding to, um, we're not exactly sure where the request came from for some Binax Now uh, testing that we might be able to implement in Humboldt, but we would like to uh, learn more about that and, and see if that's something that we could do. That's all I have. I'm happy to um, entertain any questions. I also have um, our Humboldt County Health Board Chairman, Ken Tipton, is in this meeting if um, he would like to share anything or if you have questions for him as well. No, I, I don't have anything else. I think our, our, our problem still, uh, for the most part, is in the family, family gatherings. And uh, I do think we have some problems with, with the, the uh, situation where we lie, where we have uh, these highways coming through a small town and stopping here for gasoline, groceries, and what have you, and, and moving on. And we have little or no control over that. Uh, other than that, I don't have anything. I thank you, Nicole, for, for delivering this report. Uh, I certainly wasn't prepared to give it. I've been in meetings with NACO all week, so I haven't been on that. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Tipton. And thank you, Nicole, for the uh, update. Um, uh, I'd like to open it up to members of the task force for any questions, comments, concerns regarding um, what we heard with uh, Humboldt County. The um, so I appreciate the uh, appreciate the update to the plan. I guess my question, same question for you, Nicole, that I've asked uh, the other communities here. Does do you? Uh, does Humboldt County have any recommendations for state mitigation measures given our uh, current rapid climb um, as well? Chairman Cage, I um, hesitate to, to speak on um, our health board's behalf, but I, in conversations, and I feel confident in saying this, that our, our um, health officer, Dr. Charles Stringham, um, would absolutely say this. Uh, he actually is on the call, but he is with a patient right now. Um, but he um, he very much uh, is worried. He's he's very concerned. He's deeply concerned about what's happening um, in Humboldt, and of course we are with the whole state. But we are concerned about gathering, and whether that means lowering those gathering limits, I I think that. Um, that is something that he and I have discussed, uh, just an uh, elongation of stay-at-home orders, recommendations, um, just helping uh, people from, from your level to help us, um, help our, our residents understand the seriousness of this. I, I absolutely appreciated um, the, the commentary, the, the, the uh, great information leading up to this and, and my apologies that I don't know all of all of the, the names of, of our great state leaders that are on this call, but just the, the, uh, the fact that people really are just saying, um, I don't care if I get this. I, I can't tell you how many people tell me that uh, a day, a week. Um, I'm okay if I get this. I'm okay if, if my family gets this and, and we're not okay with that. Um, you might have mild symptoms, but you might infect somebody and, and they might have devastating symptoms, symptoms that would change their lives or their families forever. And um, we, we are concerned. Um, we, we continue to share these same messages and it just seems like uh, the same people are listening and the same people are not listening. And so I, I guess that's a really long answer to say we are hopeful for um, some strengthening from the state. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that, Nicole. Um, and I don't know if Commissioner Tipton, you're, you're still on or not. Uh, I guess I would have the same question for, for you from either the uh, commission standpoint or the health board standpoint. Um, do you have any recommendations for the state for us to take um, to the governor uh, for 
um, for consideration as we look at the end of the two week period that that started last Tuesday. Oh, thank you, Mr. Cage. I, I really, uh, I really don't. I, I guess uh, I would say that my thought on it is, is each each county is different, and so often when we have a recommendation come out on the state as a blanket recommendation, it doesn't fit all counties, and. I don't see, when I look at the numbers across the state, it looks like we're, we're all struggling to keep our numbers in line. And so I think that what we can do on a local basis is, is probably as good as, as anywhere. Uh, we've got some good plans. We have some good plans uh, together right now in order. And I think education is the thing. and and. Unfortunately, we won't be able to educate all of the people. And there are, I'm guessing from what I see in national polls, at least half of the population that uh, like uh, Nicole stated, just don't care. And I don't know how you combat that. Uh, even if you have uh, a blanket recommendation for the whole state by the governor, uh, that 50% of the population doesn't care. So that's all I have to say on that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Tipton. Um, so uh, are there other questions, comments from members of the task force regarding this plan? Okay, um, I'd like to go to, um, we've got, uh, do we have anybody on from Lincoln County? I know that there was a conflict challenge and, and um, Eric was unable to um, make it. Is anybody on from Lincoln? This is Megan. I don't believe anyone was able to join from Lincoln County. They provided their comments in writing. Thank you, Megan. We'll follow up with, uh, with Lincoln from here since they do have a, an approved plan and I know uh, Eric is is one deep in his position and and uh, unable to participate. So uh, let's make a note to to follow up with him um, specifically. Let's go to um, Elko County next. And uh, I think I saw some some names. Do we have um, Commissioner Andriozzi or um, uh, Amanda Osborne on um, now for um, Elko? Thank you, Chair, Chair Cage. This is Amanda Osborne with Elko County. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to skip through the assessment section of the plan. Um, most of that's just a change in the data, which you already have. Um, so if we can skip just to the action plan. Um, that would be great, Amanda, thank you. Okay, so a couple of changes. Um, one is, um, you know, we've, we've continued to work on the testing piece here locally. And thank you again to uh, the team that has continued to support that and to our local leadership that has supported that. Um, we are still working to uh, set up some instrumentation here in Elko to be able to support uh, our as well as perhaps the surrounding counties. But for right now, um, that's a work in progress. Uh, staffing is going to continue to be a challenge with that. But um, we are also working with our congregate uh, facilities, including both the jail and the skilled nursing facility to uh, take advantage of the Quest program, which um, we learned about um, a couple days ago. So we're working through that process with them to get the account set up, which does take some time. So I anticipate hopefully that being the first week in December. Um, and then we did receive 10,000 Abbott Binax Now test kits uh, last Saturday. Uh, again, thank you to the DEM team for coordinating that shipment. Uh, we are going to start utilizing those on Saturday this weekend um, as just kind of a, a test case scenario um, to ensure that the other providers who are um, approved to use that test uh, just to work out the kinks in that process. So anyways, uh, we do have that going on. And then we have also partnered with Great Basin College to support uh, a Why I Wear a Mask campaign. So we've dedicated uh, some CARES Act funding to that. And they're leading that project and are working with uh, our local media outlets, including our radio stations, um, our signboard and uh, groups, 
So we do have a couple of rotating signboards here in Elko. Uh, we'll be working on getting some of that messaging up there um, just to have a, a clear and consistent communication and message about wearing masks here in Elko County. And then um, moving on, I did share a picture of Com uh, Commissioner Andreozzi um, sharing that message as we are engaging our local leaders to be at the forefront of, of sharing that and the importance of slowing the spread of the virus here in the county. Most importantly, probably in this plan is the enforcement section, which we had a conversation about last week. Um, so a couple of things have happened since we talked on Thursday. Um, one of those is that we have reached out to Director Reynolds' team um, to see how we can better collaborate at a local level and support efforts, as well as follow up on complaints and or referrals being received by Nevada OSHA. We do have a call scheduled with uh, Jacob LaFrance tomorrow with some of our community team leaders, including Elko City Manager Curtis Calder. Um, on that note, we're aware of a couple of establishments here in Elko that have had some uh, concerns and or problems. And in my conversation yesterday with Mr. Calder, I understand that there uh, will be some meetings with those uh, establishments. So I'm hoping that that will be helpful to curb the spread of the virus here in Elko. In addition to that, uh, we are working on some inc increased communication to local businesses on the importance of the directives, including uh, wearing masks, social distancing, and uh, following capacity guidance. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, we want to make sure that they understand that there are resources available, such as PPE, um, cleaning supplies, those kinds of things. Um, we've done a pretty good job of stockpiling. PPE here in Elko, so um, we're happy to support uh, their efforts and compliance uh, really through the use of that. And then really the rest of the plan hasn't changed as far as um, the violation structure goes. Um, so that is the overview of the change in our plan. Um, we share some of the same concerns as you've heard already. Um, our hospital capacity is certainly being stressed at this point. And then um, some of the facilities that we transfer out to are, are feeling the same stress, which includes um, facilities in Utah as well as Reno and um, the Idaho area between Boise and Twin Falls. So um, staffing is going to continue to be a challenge. We do have the ability to expand within our own facility, but again, it would take the staff to do that. So um, would love to see that battle board medical group uh, be built up again. So um, with that, Domo, I don't know if you're still on the line, if you'd like to add anything. No, thanks, Amanda. I, I would certainly stand for any questions. Thanks, Amanda and Delmo. This is Caleb Cage again for the record. I want to I want to thank you for updating this and uh, for the follow up conversations we had last week as well um, to to make sure we were all on the same page. And I really appreciate um, the uh, particularly uh, appreciate the picture uh, showing uh, Delmo's great work in the community and and the leadership putting putting himself forward to, to, um, to put that message out there. And, and if you haven't taken a look at that yet, I, I encourage you to, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, I hope you don't mind me saying Delmo it's, it's comical, but, uh, but, uh, an appropriate message. And, and, and I, and I do very much appreciate your, your leadership with that. Um, the, uh, regarding the testing turnaround, I want to thank you all as well for working so closely with the state. I think we've made some, some real progress in um, uh, moving the needle on that. And I know we won't see the benefits of that from for, for, for a little while longer now, but um, I do appreciate your effort and, um, uh, and, and all of the work on that. I'd like to open it up now to members of the um, uh, task force to see if you have any questions or comments, anything you'd like to add um, at this point. I, I'm not hearing any, so this is Caleb Cage again. I'd like to see from uh, Amanda or um, any of the Elko representatives on right now. Um, do you have any recommendations for the state as we continue to um, uh, look at options for um, go to, to give to the governor for his consideration um, regarding our current uh, mitigation measures that are in place and things that we may be able to do from the state perspective that, that again, that we can make uh, recommendations to the governor on? 
that's a tough question, Caleb. Um, you know, I don't want to speak on behalf of our board necessarily, but um, you know, we've talked about gathering sizes and all of that, and really, based on the current directives, we don't have a space that, other than the convention center, and to my knowledge, there's not anything planned in that space um, for the foreseeable future anyways, um, as far as gathering sizes or limitations go. Um, that that would probably be helpful to reduce uh, the number of, of folks who can gather together. Um, however, my concern with that is still, um, you know, we're seeing most of our spread coming from, you know, the family gatherings, the, the things that happen um, in a private home and things along those lines. So I'm, I'm not certain that that will be effective, but I think it's worth a shot. Chairman Cage, this is Delmo. Um, I, I do appreciate the opportunity. You know, I've been listening to you ask everybody that question, I, and I and I appreciate that. And I think, um, you know, to give everybody an opportunity to kind of speak, and it's a it is comp it's a complicated thing, no question about it, because it's one of those. It's a scenario where it reminds me where it, uh, it's death by a thousand cuts. You know, because there's a lot of different things that are happening here, and I. I and I know this is going to sound really simple, um, and I apologize for that, but I, but I do think it's part of the messaging is that, you know, I don't know that uh, while um, someone else talked about how divided our communities are about the reality of it, you know, the, the overarching goal, what, the goal for all of us is, I, I don't know that that's very clear. And um, I'm in my mind, I have what my goal is here for, for our communities here, and that is to, you know, make sure we don't overwhelm that hospital capacity, and and you know, because I just don't see the disease go going away anytime soon. So I look at the hospital capacity, and I also look at the active rates. You know, we've in a month we've gone from 50 active to maybe two or three uh, hospitalized, maybe four, up to almost 400 active cases, and you know we're. Um, 12, 13 people hospitalized. So that to me is kind of like the goal. But the other thing also is just this societal issue. You know, I, I think that there's a lot of folks because they've either known someone that's had the disease, had mild symptoms. So I don't know how we market to the people that, um, you know, that don't understand what's in it for me because part of that's our society. Uh, you know, I almost wish that we would, uh, government is terrible, I think, at, uh, you know, uh, marketing, and we should probably could take a page out of the playbook of Amazon or um, any one of those other companies that will figure out a way to sell people that they don't on something they don't even really realize that they need. So those are um, some of my comments. But I, I think I, I think in 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 short, without knowing that it's not going away, if we can kind of uh, really kind of rally behind what the purpose of what we're trying to do and what the goal is, I think could help because that is not when people don't know where they're going um th i think it leaves them a little bit more hopeless so it's very simple caleb and i apologize pi apologize for that but that's what's on my heart and in my mind no i thank you delmo i i um i i, I welcome all, all of the the input and so um you know amanda and i have spoken about um the uh the possibility of of um me coming out there and and um, like I said, doing a round table. I think we talked about last time having a discussion, um, maybe maybe meeting with with folks locally, and I think addressing the issue of the um, of the vision and our mission overall is is relevant and important. So um, I, I appreciate it, and and um, simple solutions are are uh, often overlooked. So I think having something like that that we could. Uh, we can identify and adjust and address um, is important. So um, thank you for that very much. Any other members of the um, task force with questions, comments, concerns uh, regarding the discussion so far? Caleb Dave Foberson. Go ahead, Dave. I, I really appreciate we, what the, the commissioner just said there talking about what the mission was. It, back when we were going through the first spike and in, in planning for everything we we're talking about, slowing the spread to allow our healthcare system infrastructure to be able to meet the goal. And I think we did have some defined, what were we really trying to do? 
And so that really struck a chord with me about what is the overarching goal and, and getting that message out that it's not we're going to eradicate the disease, but what are we really trying to do and how are we trying to do it? I think that's a very valid point. Agreed. And, and I think that um, going back to the, um, uh, the road to recovery plan and identifying some of those, those items uh, give us a good starting point for that. So um, thank you. Any other members of the task force? Okay, hearing none, um, thank you very much um, to uh, Elko. We'll follow up, we'll get, continue to work on the, um, um, we'll continue to work on the test, um, the, the testing equipment issue uh, and related issues and we'll give you an update on that. I know we've got some meetings coming up on that as well, but appreciate um, everything. And um, we will go to Lyon County next. Mr. Page, are you available? I am. Good afternoon. It is afternoon, isn't it? Yes, it is. Well into uh, it. Yes, sir. Uh, all right. Well, you have our report. Um, I, I wish I could say that we um, found a miracle cure and we're done, um, but we're not. And so I'm not going to rehash everything everybody else has discussed. Our, our focus is and will continue to be messaging. That's the only thing that we seem to have any control over at this point in time. Caleb, you, you've heard it from just about everybody. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And you've got a segment of the population, you have a segment of the politicians who are all saying the same thing, and that's, you're violating my rights, this is my free will, I can do what I want to do. I can't change that, you can't change that. I heard somebody ask about quarantine. I have researched the statute to nth degree. Fogerson can testify to this. We've had these conversations way back in the past, planning for these types of, of situations. The reality of it is, is the message as the commissioner from Elko stated, has to be very clear. We are doing this to reduce the threat to our hospitals and our healthcare systems. If you will work with us for the next three weeks and do these things, we may have a better chance of getting the public to, to follow suit. But I am here to tell you when people start threatening to shut down the government, when, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I'm getting it from both sides. When I have at 5.45 in the morning, my first phone call is an angry Republican calling me because a governor's daughter is threatening that Las Vegas is going to be shut down because they're not paying attention. And that's hitting the hitting the news. When I the next phone call I get is a letter from the Republican caucus to the governor about not shutting down. We're, we're doing nothing but creating more panic and anger in our communities and our population. So we are working within Lyon County and hopefully with the Quad County to do some messaging. I, we've contracted with or signing a contract this afternoon with a company to do some uh, public safe, public service announcements to put our social media with each of our individual commissioners, a couple of the mayors to you know ask people to follow suit, to do what needs to be done. Um, on a statewide level, I know we're talking about doing a, a statewide effort with local officials, emergency managers, fire chiefs to do the same thing to get the message out. And I think that's, I think that's the solution to the issue is if, if people see what the, the problem is, when, when, when you show not, when the, the guy from Renown gets up with the governor and talks about how bad it is for his hospital. And when people see those kinds of things, they pay attention. But when we have idle threats, and I don't, I don't mean that to sound the way it sounded, but we have threats that we're gonna shut things down I can't speak for the urban areas, but I can tell you what it does in my community. And that's why I go to work at six o'clock in the morning so I can get there before everybody's out and, and awake so they don't see me. And that's why I sell their home at night in the darkness so they can't see me because I'm tired of getting beat up by the general public over what politicians are doing. I, I know you have no control over it and I'm sorry I keep venting this, but this is a public health issue, not a political issue. And we got to treat it, treat it that way. And I don't know how to convince the politicians, my own board included, that this is a, a, a public health issue. People are dying, hospitals are full, people are sick. Let's focus our efforts on getting that message out. That's all I got. Thank you, Sorry. Jeff. No, I appreciate it. That's meaningful and powerful. I, I, I greatly appreciate your candor. Um, and I agree, it's not a political issue. And uh, I have said as much myself and um, and completely appreciate the position you're in. Um, 
um, we have a we have a, a plan here that was approved last week. Um, we've had some some discussions uh, here today. Um, do you have any any recommendations at the um, for for changes at the uh, state level that we should present to the governor as we uh, wrap up this two week period, Jeff? Um, just if we can get some clear, consistent messaging from from the governor himself down to the newest elected county commissioner and city councilman um, from the political side that, yeah, we see it's a problem. Like, like I've been I've been talking as far as, um, you know, we, we got the testing issues. We're working on getting those fixed. I, I think the state of Nevada and every county and city in the state of Nevada has done a phenomenal job of working together to address the, the policies or the practices and the procedures. It's just getting the politics off our back so we can do do the job that needs to be done. So I don't have any recommendations for the state. Um, I, I got to tell you, I wake up every morning thanking God that I'm not the governor because I would, wouldn't want to be in his shoes. Um, this is not an easy, easy time for anybody. Um, I, I've heard the uh, COVID, um, uh, whatever they call it, I just call it apathy. People are done. They're tired. Um, people are, are trying to go back to work and trying to live and trying to deal with, with family events. And in the, I know it's like in the urban areas, but you know, when we get into talking about family gatherings, we have multiple families in, in the county that have um, 12, 13 people living in a household. And so that's just every day. That's not Thanksgiving, that's just every day. So we're gonna have, it's gonna go through families. It's, it's gonna happen. But, but let's just focus on the messaging from the statewide basis and get all 17 counties and however many cities there are to get the same message out. We're doing this to keep our hospitals from, from blowing up. And, and once once things calm down, then we can lighten up a little bit and see where things go. That's it. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. And I don't envy you either for the work you having to do and, and appreciate your partnership as well. Um, like to open it up to members of the uh, task force now to um, ask any questions or make any comments regarding the uh, Lyon County presentation here. Okay, hearing none, thank you, Jeff. Look forward to working with you going forward as well. Um, we were requested by the uh, Carson City to go uh, near the end. Um, I think I see uh, Nikki Aker here <clears throat> and Nancy Paulson as well. So, excuse me. Uh, Nancy, uh, welcome and, and, and thank you for uh, the update, please. Um, uh, again, what we're looking for here is um, an overview of the um, uh, any of the significant changes to your plan, any recommendations for the state to consider as far as mitigation measures are concerned, and um, uh, and any resource requests from the state at this point. So please, Carson City, proceed. Thank you. This is Nancy Paulson, Carson City Manager. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so last week, the task force approved Carson City's plan with two modifications. The first was that the city adopt a decision-making guide and an event planning metrics for determining conditions for larger events. Therefore, uh, we've attached in our plan Appendix A, which is a special events under 250 people checklist that the city will require for events to assist event sponsors in drafting an event-specific operational plan to ensure a safe and successful event. In addition, the city has developed, um, and thank you with special help from Southern Nevada Health District, an event gathering decision matrix that uh, will provide a guide using various parameters such as positivity rates and hospital capacity to determine when large gatherings should be allowed and at what capacity. And this is attached as appendix two in our plan. Uh, the, the second modification was that the city's enforcement component must be built out with a comprehensive and coordinated approach that incorporates uh, elements that drive the enforcement model. So Carson City has established a COVID compliance task force in order to, to do this. And the first meeting was held on November 13th and we will continue to meet weekly to discuss efforts 
to further engage our businesses in the compliance efforts. So members of the task force are our mayor elect, the city manager, the deputy city manager, our health and human services director, our epidemiologist, uh, emergency manager, one of our, our under sheriff, uh, community development director. And we've also engaged uh, people outside the city, the uh, Carson City Chamber of Commerce director as a, our liaison to the business community and the CEO of Nevada Builders Alliance to engage with the construction industry. And lastly, Western Nevada College president to engage the city's college students as that age group accounts for the second highest number of COVID cases in Carson City. So following that task force meeting, I contacted Terry Reynolds with uh, Business and Industry to discuss what training would be available for compliance checks. And the city has a meeting scheduled tomorrow with OSHA staff to further discuss that training and the city's compliance plan. In addition, we're in the process of hiring a compliance coordinator to facilitate the city's compliance inspections. And uh, we actually have an interview on Monday for that position. So our plan is to increase compliance activity by increasing efforts to inspect businesses that uh, we're seeing maybe out of compliance based on our contact tracing information, prior history, and just working in consultation with OSHA and business and industry. Uh, we'll, we will also conduct, or hopefully we'll be able to conduct weekly me meetings with business and industry team. Uh, to align our inspection execution and to ensure that uh, our local enforcement team is focused on the right business to improve compliance in those areas. Uh, complaints will be continue to be received through the COVID hotline. And um, on a positive note, the city's businesses are doing an amazing job as seen in the documentation that's included in the packet today from OSHA. I was pleased to see that Carson City had a compliance rate of 96%. That was just one violation in the first observation from November 4th to the 17th. And for the second observation, we had 100% compliance rate. So great job Carson City businesses and their employees. Just to, to touch on community education, uh, this week we did a press release related to the holidays, family gatherings and actions that uh, should be taken to prevent the spread of COVID. And this information went out through social media. A flyer will be included in the city's weekly utility bills and to our school families working through the Carson City School District. And also beginning this week, uh, we're producing weekly videos featuring members of our Carson City leadership asking the community to follow the public health guidance. The first one was released yesterday featuring our acting mayor, Brad Bonkowski. As far as requests for the state, um, Carson City's number of active cases as of yesterday was 615, but of those 505 are inmates at the Warm Springs Correctional Center. So due to this large number of positive cases at the prison, the city is requesting that the Department of Corrections establish a field hospital just in an effort to reduce the impact on our overall hospital operations at Carson Tahoe. In addition, uh, I think Kyra mentioned this earlier, we are working with the state to try to get the prison positive cases removed from our community case statistics. Uh, like she said, uh, that would have a significant change in um, our numbers, but, but again, it would probably not take us out of that elevated transmission status. And one other thing, we know that furloughs are going, are supposed to start with the state in January and that would include NG employees. And so we're just requesting that um, the state waive that requirement for the NG staff that's working on the COVID-19 response. Uh, as we have a few of these employees and they're crucial to Carson City's operations. And with that, that's the end of my report. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate that. And, and uh, we have uh, gotten a couple of requests regarding um, three of your uh, requ or requests from the state, which are um, dealing with the 
uh, the National Guard beyond the middle of December, expanding the uh, CF, C, um, CRF dollars, CARES Act dollars beyond um, December 30th, and uh, and and now um, addressing the um, the length of um, or the the um, furloughs as well. So we will continue to follow up on those. And um, Kyra has been a great advocate on the prison numbers issue. And I, she and I have been back and forth a few times. I just haven't had a chance to, to really look at it. But um, Kyra, let's continue to, um, to, to, well, let's make time to sit down and kind of discuss those issues and see what we can do. Uh, I just, I think your response was sufficient to my email, but just want to make sure um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about it all correctly, if that's okay with you. Okay. Yeah, uh, this is Kyra and um, totally agreed. I'm happy to have any conversations. And then just to reiterate, we did check um, and I can confirm that none of the counties were impacted enough at this point uh, to actually remove them from having elevated transmission if we pull out those prison populations. Really all that does is um, when we talk about community spread, obviously those folks are in a different population. They're not intermingling with the, you know, the greater population at large. And so that's the logic um, with removing them from the county chapter. We would still be counting those cases in our total numbers for counties. Uh, they just wouldn't go towards that specific criteria for, for community transmission. Thank you, Kyra. I appreciate that. Um, any members of the task force have additional um, updates or questions or uh, requests? Dave? Dave Fogerson for the record. We noticed in the plan this morning, review it, uh, reviewing it, Lieutenant Compton and myself, Lieutenant Colonel Compton and myself, that CTH was uh, kind of on the verge of needing some PPE. So uh, DEM has reached out to see, to the Car City Emergency Manager to see what the status is there and what support they might need from the state. Thank you. Any other questions or comments regarding um, Carson City's update? Okay, before we close out this agenda item, any additional um, questions, comments, um, concerns regarding the entire agenda item that we've been considering here? Caleb, this is Terry Reynolds. Uh, just a kind of an overall comment. I, I'm really impressed by the, the level of activity that's gone on uh, with the various communities. I think they've really um, took, taken a hard look at their communities and what they feel is most effective to be able to get the message across. And I think if anything, uh, you know, we've learned over the last several months, it's it's not one thing. It's not just enforcement. It's not just um, uh, doing certain uh, things. It, it's a lot of different um, uh, actions that take place uh, within the community. It's PSAs, it's getting uh, buy-in from uh, the elected officials and the public and the businesses to be able to support a community-wide effort to be able to uh, you know stem the tide of the number of cases within the community and it's not just uh, it's just not government action it, it, it's action by everybody and i think that's the message that we all need to buy into kind of an overall action plan to be able to stem uh, the tide of this and, and there needs to be kind of a, a, a a mission and a message that goes through uh, and a purpose uh, in the community, not just you need to do this. Uh, you need to do this because it's impacting our healthcare system and it's going to have a significant uh, cost to the community uh, and, and to our healthcare uh, networks within our state if we don't stem this tide. So I, I think that what we heard today is that uh, there needs to be several different actions. Uh, not just not just enforcement, not just um, governmental action, but there needs to be several uh, actions taken place to be able to make this successful. So that's kind of the message I, I heard today, and that's the message that uh, I think needs to be brought forward. So thank you, Caleb. I appreciate it, Terry, and I, I would agree with you. I think you look at what um, Elko and Carson, I mean, you can go through the plans and the, the things that we requested uh, to be in there were, were in there, and I think we all know um, that it's it's a it's a it's a it's a challenge. I think it was the chancellor earlier who said it's a marathon, and um, and 
uh, we need to learn from these issues. We've got uh, the political challenges. We've got the uh, the case spread and community spread throughout the state as well. Um, that that reminds me, uh, if Nancy, you're still on, um, do you? One of the questions I'd like to just see if you have any um, feedback directly on is, um, do you have any recommendations for the state's consideration? And you may have addressed this already, but but I don't believe I heard it. Um, the state, any recommendations for the state's consideration as we um, wrap up this uh, this two week observation period? Um, for Carson City, uh, I don't have any additional mitigation measures other than what the governor's already done with the state home 2.0. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I think with that, we are ready to, um, to close out agenda item number six. Uh, and I do realize these numbers are, these meetings are long. I think they're important. Um, and especially in these, in these uh, difficult times right now, like to see real quick, uh, open up agenda item number seven and see if any of the local health authorities on the agenda, Carson, Southern Nevada or Washoe uh, have any specific updates on the uh, status of safe ga gathering, gatherings and event plan review that uh, has not been provided in the, um, in the previous agenda item. Chair Cage, this is Misty Robinson. Know everything that I had to say, I provided with the Clark County um, report. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and and Megan, a, um, just a, a note for you and me. Let's let's um, remember to put uh, this item under agenda item number six for future agendas, so we're we're um, tying them together. Um, and Chair Cage, this is Nikki Aker, and sure. all my items were addressed in item number six as well. Great. Thank you very much, Nikki. I'll pause for a minute to talk to um, Washington, see if Washoe County has anything to add. Okay, hearing none. Um, so I want to I want to open up agenda item number eight and um, briefly talk about this. We we started having meetings, um, I believe. The first meeting was uh, was over a week ago, and the idea was to um, to really to do two things. One was to get the ground truth on what the difference between the reported turnaround times that we have from Kyra, um, which are an average of two days right now, and what we're hearing is the experienced uh, turnaround time from our local partners. This has been a persistent challenge for all of us over the last uh, few months, and. Um, so we put together a group. We had uh, Dr. Pandori on and, and uh, folks, relevant folks from um, Department, of, uh, um, Department of Health and Human Services. And um, we, we just brainstormed at first to identify all of the, um, the different aspects of it to, to start to see, A, what those challenges might be, and B, what our solutions might be. And I have to say, I'm, I'm really impressed with the traction that has already happened within the first week. Um, and uh, we're continuing to, to meet. Uh, so we've had two meetings now and uh, we're looking at what the, uh, the process is within the reporting system, um, what, the, uh, what the, the additional resources we may be able to provide, working with specific counties in order to provide resources to them for additional testing, uh, as well as um, working on staffing for the uh, lab licensure um, group within the Division of Public and Behavioral Health to make sure we are um, we are fully staffed and able to get labs turned around, uh, their licenses turned around as quickly as possible. So um, I just want to let you know we've had two meetings on that. We're starting to get to a point where I think we can we can start formally reporting uh, written reports here uh, in the near term, but. Um, very positive um, uh, progress so far, and um, and I'm I'm grateful to everybody who's been a part of those conversations, and uh, I look forward to continuing to update you on those going forward. I know we have uh, a couple people on here who have also been engaged in that process, as well as members of the task force who have not. So I'd like to open it up for discussion and see if there are any questions or comments regarding uh, where we are in this process right now. Director Cage, this is Dagny Stapleton from NACO. 
Um, and I just want to thank you and Julia, especially for your work on this. Um, I have been involved on this cause and with that group a little bit, and there really has been a substantial amount of work done already. Um, and it's really heartening that there's uh, progress made and you guys really dug in and got to some of the details and what the needs were, and it's really encouraging. Um, thanks so much. Thank you, Dagny. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate that as well. Julia? I was just going to say, I to echo what Dagny has said, it's been um, a great opportunity. I, I do want to say that under Dr. Pandori's leadership as well, we might have opportunities now to make investments um, with the COVID dollars that will improve public health ongoing. Some of the efforts that his state public health lab is doing um, to outreach to our rural communities and build capacity in our rural communities that will benefit to COVID absolutely in real time, potential to really grow our public health system ongoing. So just wanna acknowledge him, acknowledge Elko County who's really come to the table wanting solutions. So it's it's been a great opportunity. We've seen cracks in the system and we've offer, offered solutions for those. Um, and so I appreciate everybody being opened and candid on those calls and um, I'm really excited how this will improve public health in perpetuity. Thank you, Julie. I agree with all of that. Any other comments regarding this? Uh, this is Mark Pandori. I just want to thank Northeastern Regional Hospital for working closely with the Public Health Lab and finding a solution to set up some additional testing in that part of the state. Um, it's not an easy thing to do to set up a new laboratory, but people are really trying to open up and do whatever they can to solve this problem. And I'm, I'm deeply appreciative of it. Thank you. Thank you for your work as well, Mark. Um, we have a, uh, we have, I'm gonna go ahead and move past uh, agenda item number eight and go to agenda item number, uh, we'll skip past uh, agenda item number nine as well. I hope to have some updates on this in the very near term as far as what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, we've got a few pieces um, that, are, that are still yet to be determined and decided on what exactly we're gonna be looking for, but um, hope to have um, a quick, um, update for you at our at our next meeting as well. So um, we'll go to agenda item number 10. And uh, again, note that um, your public comment, the written public comment was provided to you in your board packets for um, for this meeting, and uh, as well as uh, are provided online for your consideration as well. And I appreciate you reviewing those. Um, at this time, I'd like to reopen public comment for this meeting and remind everyone that no action may be taken upon a matter raised under this item of the agenda until the matter itself has been specifically included on an agenda as an item upon which action may be taken. Public comments may be limited to two minutes per person at the discretion of the chair. Comments will not be restricted based on viewpoint. Um, we have instructions in the agenda for calling in. If you have called in uh, and you'd like to make public comment, please press star six to unmute yourself. Um, unmute yourself and uh, make um, any public comment identifying yourself, make any public comment and uh, um, we, will, we will go from there. So is there any caller who would like to make public comment at this time? Okay, I wanna give it a little more time here again. Um, public comment will be limited to two minutes, press star, six to unmute yourself and um, uh, identify yourself and provide public comment. Is there any public comment at this time? I'm not, hear I'm not hearing any public comment. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? Dave Fulgerson, I'll make a motion to adjourn. And a second. Dagny, a second. Thank you, Dagny has seconded. All those in favor of adjourning, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed vote aye. no. Thank you all very much and we'll talk to you again soon. We'll get, the, we'll get an announcement about the next scheduled meeting out as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Aye. 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 Be opposed right now.
Hello, can Hello? you hear me? Yes. Hello? Oh, okay. It looked like the meeting was ending. Oh, the yeah, I yes, called I, in. Uh, I can about, do my comment? No, the meeting has ended. Okay, well, I did star six all the time that he kept saying that to make a comment and oh, and there was okay. never a response. Like the meeting was ending. We did not hear yeah, you yeah, yeah. in the meeting. I did. Okay, I did star six over and over. I muted myself and muted myself. So to make a comment and and there was never a response. The meeting was ending. We did not hear you in the meeting. I did. Okay. Hello, are you still there? Over and over. I muted myself and muted myself. Hello? Hi, is this Caleb Cage or? No, ma'am. I think you and I were trying to make public comment, but they certainly didn't give us enough time to do that. I know. I kept doing the star six 